فسوف تكون هنالك اختبار ورقي سوف نقوم بجمع البيانات من خلال هذه الورقه والتي سوف توزع على جميع المرشحين واذا جميع المرشحين سوف يحضرون بذات الاسئله وذات الاختبار وعلى ذات الوقت وذات اليوم حتى نتاكد من ان لا يكون هنالك اي مجال للغش اذا بعد ذلك كما ترون الطريقه الاخرى للتنظيم هو ان نجعل هذا الاختبار متشابها اذا كما ترون هنا على الشاشة فالعديد من الشركات تقوم بوضع اختبار واحد موحد لجميع المرشحين إذا عندما ترون في الشاشة فسوف ترون أننا انتقلنا إلى النقطة الثالثة وهي أن أن الوقت المخصص إذا يكون هنالك أداء للاختبار متعدد إذن يكون لدينا اختبارات ليست فقط ورقية ولكن أيضا قد تكون اختبارات متعددة الأشكال وقد تكون أيضا عبر التكنولوجي وأحد الطرق الأخرى ولكن لدينا ما يسمى ال اختبارات التي يتم انتقاؤها بناء على المجموعات إذا من خلال القيام بهذا فسوف يكون قد أدينا الاختبار وبنماذج مختلفة لجميع المرشحين وهذه جميع المنهجيات الاختبار وطرقها إذا يجب أن نتأكد من أن كل اختبار يكون ذو علاقة بالمحتوى وأيضا الصعوبة تكون متنوعة إذا ايضا كما تعرفوا قد يكون لدينا الاختبار اللوفت قد يكون ايضا احد انواع المنهجية الاختبار ولدينا هنا الاختبار التبني او المتبنى فهو يكون اختبار النموذج او المنهج الاخير وكما ترون على هذا فسوف يكون لدينا تنوع في هذا الاختبار وبعض المؤسسات تقوم باستعماله للتنوع. إذا أرغب بالتأكد من أن الشات يعمل وأن تشاركونا بتحديد الصعوبات التي وما هي آراءكم فيما يتعلق بالصعوبات أو التحديات المتعلقة بالانتقال إلى إلى الشاشة. إذا هل يكون التعليم أم هل يكون تقييم؟ ما الذي قد تجدونه صعبا أو قد يشكل تحديا بالنسبة لكم. إذا يمكنكم استخدام خاصية الشات في أسفل أو دردشة في أسفل الشاشة في الأيقونة. إذا سوف ننتظر بعض الثواني لنعرف منكم ما هي التحديات أو الصعوبات التي قد تكون متعلقة التي تواجهونها فيما يتعلق بالتحرك عبر على الشاشة. أو الانتقال عبر الشاشة. إذا شاركونا عبر الدردشة في أسفل الشاشة لديكم وأطلعونا بالتحديات التي قد تواجهنا سواء كانت تحديات متعلقة بالتعليم أم بالتقييم. Okay, I can't see anything coming through, but we have experience. إذا لا أرى أن هناك مشاركات ولكن قد نعلم أن التحديات لدى الشركة التي عملنا معها كانت بعضها متنوعة إذا سوف أطرح لكم بعضها إذا في الشريحة التالية إذا أحد التحديات الأخرى وهي البنية التحتية البنية التحتية يجب أن نتأكد من أن جميع المرشحين يستطيعون يكون لديهم اتصال ويستطيعون أن يكون لديهم أيضا التكنولوجي يستطيعون من خلالها المشاركة أو إجراء الأخبار ورأينا أيضا بعض الشركات شكل هذه بالنسبة لهم تحدي إذا دعوني أشرح لكم أيضا أحد التحديات هي الأسعار التي قد تكون مؤثرة أساسيا أو تكون لا يوجد فيها أمان أو خصوصية إذا أيضا تغيير الاختبار ف 
فبدلا من تقديم اختبار موحد لجميع الاشخاص في نفس اليوم في نفس التوقيت اذا انتقلنا الى الطريقه الديناميكيه فسوف يكون هنالك امكانيه للحضور او المرشحين الدخول في اوقات مختلفه وهذا سوف يعيق المصداقيه الاختبار وقد يسبب الى عمليات الغش وبحيث ان يكون لدينا مرشحين يدخل في اوقات مختلفه احد التحديات الاخرى اذا ذهبنا الى شريحة الاخرى اذا غيرنا الى غيرنا منهجيه الى الديناميكيه فقد تكون هنالك بعض الامور المقلقه والمتعلقه بان الاختبار قد يكون مساويا او متعادلا ويشكل ذات الصعوبه او او يكون فيه مواساه ومعادله لجميع المختبرين اذا فاذا غيرنا هذه الاسئله فقد تكون مختلفه العناصر الموجوده واذا احد الشركات او المؤسسات تكون لديها اختبارات مسبقه ويحددون مستوى الصعوبه ويقومون بعد ذلك بتنويع الاسئله بعد ان قاموا بفحص وتقييم صعوبه هذه الاسئله حتى يتاكدوا من ان جميع الاختبارات التي تم تقديمها هي بذات مستوى الصعوبه فلا يكون هنالك ظلم للبعض في هذه الاختبارات حسنا اذا هذه هي نهايه الجلسه الاولى أو الفقرة الأولى، إذا هل هنالك أي تعليقات أو أسئلة أو تغذية راجعة أو أي أمور ترغبون بتقديمها؟ إذا هل لدى أي أحد منكم أي أسئلة أو تعليقات أو أراء رجاء لا تترددوا في طرحها أو ذكرها في الشات أو الدردشة أسفل في الأيقونة في الأسفل. Okay. There's no questions or comments so far, so I'm going to. Sorry, if لا يوجد هنالك أي أسئلة حتى الآن سوف أنتقل إلى الجزء الآخر. Okay, so personalized assessments. As I've just covered, once you've made the move to a team, the المخصص هنا أحد الطرق. لتحسين هذا الطريقة هو عمل تقييم مخصص لكل طالب يقوم المفهوم هذا على على أعطاء كل طالب راجعة تخص كل طالب وكل طالب يختلف عن غيره وهذا هو مفهوم جديد وسنتكلم هنا عن التقنيات التي قد نستطيع استخدامها في هذه الجزئية راح أتكلم هنا عن الاختبار التكيفي فبناء على ردود في السؤال السابق نرى هنا أن هناك مستويات مختلفة على الصعوبة. هنا المرشحين لعمل اختبار نستطيع عمل على عدد الأسئلة فعلى حسب عدد الأسئلة التي يجيب عليها الشخص فإذا كانت أغلبها صحيحة كانت الدرجة أعلى وإذا كان العدد أقل فكانت الدرجة أنخفض. 
فحين يكون عدد الاسئله الاجابات الخاطئه اكثر فستقل صعوبه الاختبار اما اذا زادت صعوبه زادت الاجابات الصحيحه فبالتالي هنا نحن نزيد من صعوبه الاختبار هنا سنبحث عن عن السؤال او بدان نرى إجابات ما إذا كانت صحيحة أو غير صحيحة. سنضيف أسئلة إلى نظام أسئلة مت أسئلة إلى نظام حتى نرى المستوى الطلاب الذين يأخذ هذا الاختبار حتى يكون لدينا البيانات الكافية لتحديد. هذه الاختبارات وهذه الأسئلة ميزة أخرى هي إعطاء الطلاب الوقت ومعرفة الوقت اللازم الذي الذي استغرق الطلاب في في حل الاختبارات فحين تعمل أسئلة ستجيب من خلال عملنا مع مختصين في التعليم نرى هنا أن الأسئلة ونحاول نجد الإجابات الصحيحة. See here um, an example of of how it works in in the test during delivery. So a candidate is told when they've answered a question, get a hint or feedback, and be able to have another go at the question. So you can see here on screen the first hint. Has been given, and they have a chance to have another go at the question. This process will then be repeated multiple times if the candidate continues to answer the question incorrectly. So you'll provide a different hint after each incorrect response, providing more and more information each time. But to reflect the fact the candidate is getting help and has had multiple attempts, you can also automatically award candidates fewer marks if they reach the correct answer after receiving hints. So again, to go back to fairness, that ensures that the test is fair and that the results account for any feedback they've received. So you can do kind of similar feedback to this um, manually. So you could have a teacher, um, for example, helping a student and every time they have a go, they can provide that feedback. But that's not very scalable and it's very time consuming to have a one to one teacher student mapping. Um, but technology can help this to be, be available to more candidates. Um, to allow you to provide that, that level of support to more, more candidates at the same time. Another way of personalising assessments using technology is post-test feedback. So once the test is, is complete, it's also useful to provide students with feedback on their performance throughout the whole test. For learning purposes, you may want to allow them to see a breakdown of their performance on each question, as you can see here. And with Surpass, we, we can also allow students to view their performance on each question. So they do that by clicking back into the question and reviewing the answer they gave and the correct answer. However, more detailed personalised reports might be more useful to provide targeted feedback to students. And we've been working with the Welsh Government to provide their personalised assessment programme for reading and numeracy in schools. So they use the functionality I've, I've just explained. So they use adaptive testing and hints, as well as generating customized feedback for students, such as the ones on screen. So I'm gonna show you some examples from the Welsh Government's programme. So one type of feedback that's provided is based on student performance. And that's what you can see on the screen now. On the left is the feedback provided to the student to help them to compare their performance with other learners their age. And on the right is the information provided to teachers to help them to compare the performance of group the performance of groups of learners so if we go to the next one as well this second example provides more detailed feedback to teachers on the performance of students in their class each square and circle on the chart represents a student in, in a class and their performance is plotted on the chart so that you can visualize the spread in performance across the group and the group average is also plotted. So all of this information allows teachers to see the performance of students relative to each other and across genders. 
and that helps them to target the, the lessons that they plan and the support that they provide. If we go to the next one, another type of feedback shows performance by learning area or topic. So this particular one is an example of feedback provided to teachers that shows an average performance of their class against each of the topic areas. So they can see the relative strengths and weaknesses of the whole class. It's for teachers because it provides them with the information to their lessons to focus on areas that they need to work on. On the next one, similar information is also provided to each student. So as you can see in this example, students are shown topic areas that they're strong on and also that they may need to work on. They're also provided with a sample question that they can download um, as a PDF you can see on the right. And that means that they can continue to practice for themselves and it encourages them to, to take it upon themselves, take responsibility for their own learning. So all of these re reports are, are an example of how providing feedback really helps to personalise the learning experience for students and also teachers. So this is something that, as I've said, teachers can currently do on paper. They can provide personalised feedback during marking. Um, however, it's a very manual task and it's very time consuming. So using technology helps to automate a lot of these manual processes um, when, that are required when delivering personalised assessment and therefore it makes it a much more accessible and realistic possibility for more people in the future. Okay, so that is everything I wanted to cover from our experience on personalised assessment. I want to pause again for a minute to see if anybody has any further questions or thoughts about personalised assessment and how perhaps technology can help in the future or any thoughts about what I've just covered. So again, I'm going to just pause for a minute and see if if anybody wants to add anything into the chat. Okay, I think we'll um, we'll move on to the next section and uh, Paddy, I'll hand over to you to, to continue. Thank you, Georgie. Um, yeah, so I'm first of all going to talk a little bit about now about the replication of real world scenarios in assessment and how this is possible using Surpass. Um, but before we talk about real world scenarios in testing, though, I think we really need to think about the replication of real world scenarios in learning and in education. Um, so within pedagogy in general, but uh, particularly in higher education, the industry is seeing an increased focus on real world learning. And the idea is that real world learning is just a much better way of helping students to gain the attributes that are required for employment. Um, now, next up, I wanted to ask everyone a question, not sure if I'm going to get an answer, um, but I was going to ask which is more important, theory, practice or both. If anyone does feel like answering, please just um, raise a hand um, in the chat or just enter it in a, a chat message with you, which you think is more important. I'll pause for just a moment. <clears throat> I don't think I will. I'll move on now. But if anyone does have any answers, please do just just add it into the chat. That would be fantastic. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone agreed that both were important. If we just go ahead on those lines. Um, now, if we all agree that both theory and practice are both equally important, um, we also need to recognize that traditional methods of educating and assessing tend to be focused mainly on the former theory. Now, real world learning, um, whether you want to call it replication or experiential learning, immersive simulation, um, what it does is manages to bridge the divide between the theory and the practice. 
Now, I've already mentioned this um, as being a better way for students to gain attributes that make them good candidates for employment, but there are additional benefits as well um, that have been reported for this approach, not least that it encourages sort of lifelong learning for the student, that it makes them proactive and encourages continuous improvement for them. Um, also that it's just generally more engaging than strictly theory-based learning. It also provides a, a safe place for students to practice and to develop their skills, um, you know, allows them to develop problem-solving abilities and all of this without the inherent risk of actually being in um, the early stages of employment and just being wholly inexperienced. So this is it's more than just a trend, it's a shift towards a more holistic and engaging way of educating students and preparing them for the real world. And as pedagogy involves, uh, evolves, sorry, so must assessment. So what does this mean for assessment? Um, it means first and foremost, foremost um, we need to move away from what we see here. Instead of testing using paper, the adoption of on-screen testing, as Georgie described earlier, it makes it easier to replicate the workspace when assessing candidates. There aren't many businesses or successful ones anyway that still rely on pen and paper. It also means that within the assessment itself, there, there has to be a recreation of a real life scenario. So this is obviously in a, a, a professional setting often, but there are also useful ways of testing by replicating non-work sort of day-to-day -day scenarios as well. So these assessments need to go one step beyond assessing the candidate's theoretical understanding of the subject. They need to provide the candidate the ability to actually demonstrate their um, ability to, what's the word I'm after? Just administer that theory in practice and um, you know replicate that within the workplace. Um, what that allows the student to do is just um, have a more active role, I guess, and it better assesses their ability as they would actually manifest themselves in the real world. Um, for example, we could have an accountancy question about bookkeeping, which could ask at the end of a business day, which balances have to go into which ledgers. Now that's all, all well and good, but it only engages the candidate's theoretical knowledge. Now, a more rounded assessment might be to ask, here's a list of the transactions that have taken place today for this business, and here are all the different ledgers. Complete the ledgers to reflect the day's transactions. In this way, you don't only see what the candidate knows in theory, um, where each transaction should go, you get to see that they're actually able to carry out the task in question. They're able to perform it, not just in theory, but in practice, and uh, in a very similar scenario to one that a bookkeeper would have on the job. So that's quite a simple example, but it shows how this sort of assessment more accurately assesses how the student will be able to handle real life scenarios, particularly in the workplace. Uh, it's also a good alternative for candidates that struggle with more traditional assessment formats. So the overall aim of these assessments is to create a bridge between learning, often higher education learning, and its application in the real world of employment. But how is this achievable using Surpass? I think we should have a look at a few examples. Now, BTL have been particularly successful in the accountancy organisations, um, some of which are highlighted here. There are a number of different options within Surpass to replicate real world scenarios within the accountancy setting. Um, first up, and one of our most recent additions actually to Surpass involves our custom question type framework or CQT framework. Now, this allows organisations to create their own question types outside of the standard release schedule of Surpass and then to upload them to their own instance. So far, this has been, um, we've developed a number of different question types, including like line graphs, scatter graphs. But the one I'm showing here is our spreadsheet CQT. And as you can see, instead of being confronted with a standard multiple choice question or a short answer question on the screen, here the student is asked to uh, interact with a question that in terms of the look and the user experience, it very much replicates the software that accountants and bookkeepers would use in real world situations. An alternative to this spreadsheet CQT is to use our Excel or Word simulations, which can be used in Surpass's test driver. Again, 
These are created to replicate the candidate's experience in the real world. It matches the applications that they would use every single day if they were employed. And you can have multiple of these open at the same time as you would in real life, have multiple different applications open. Another useful feature is our file attached question type. <clears throat> this allows candidates to submit files as their answer response. This particular question also has a PDF attached as source material on the left there. So this allows you to attach large documents for candidates to refer to. And some organizations have documents well over a thousand pages that they attach to their questions. It allows the candidate to view them side by side with the question and the candidate can zoom in and highlight certain sections as well. So if we think back to the example that I used earlier, where the candidate was asked to complete the business ledgers at the end of the day, you could realize that here by attaching a document listing the day's transactions as source material, and then having the candidates create ledgers via Excel and uploading those files as their answer response. Um, and again, this is a good reproduction of what a bookkeeper's daily activity would actually involve. So these are all examples of how financializations are this functionality class now. I realize that I've been talking about accountancy a lot, which isn't relevant for all organizations. So if we move away from accountancy, um, let's have a look at our high fidelity image viewer. So this high fidelity image viewer, it allows organizations to upload high quality images to their questions and it lets candidates look at them in detail. So the candidate can open the image in its own window, as you see here. They can zoom in and out with ease. And once they've zoomed in, they can then track around the image to focus on different areas. So rather than just being forced to look at a small image off to the side of their answer option or something like that, this, this gives the student the control that a medical professional might actually have when examining an X-ray in real life. And as a result, we've seen this functionality become really popular with a lot of our clients within the medical sector. If we move away from the medical sector, let's touch upon our audio capture question type. Um, this basically allows the candidate to record their voice as their answer response. Um, they can record up to 60 minutes in length and organizations can also add audio files to these questions that the candidate can be listening to and responding to as they are recording their answer response. So as an example, you could have a question which gets the candidate to listen to an audio clip in a certain language and then ask the candidate to record their translation using the audio capture. So this functionality is also used by organizations outside of language, of language testing. So obviously in many, many different roles, a person's ability to communicate is extremely important. And if you're a, a counselor, a therapist, a teacher, any role really which requires interaction with other people, which is most roles, um, this question type can be used to rate your ability to do so. So I've mentioned a few of the ways that organizations can replicate real world scenarios within Surpass, and there are many, many studies out there to show that this method of testing provides a huge benefit to the students and candidates and, and thus to the future workforce. I'm now interested to know if anyone can think of any other ways to recreate real world scenarios in on-screen tests. Um, if anyone feels like answering um, and putting some suggestions in the chat, that would be great. Especially interested to hear if you're already replicating real world scenarios and um, that reflect the workplace. Um, I realize though this one is a thinker, you may need a bit more time to think of a response here. Um, it doesn't seem like we're getting um, any responses to that question. Um, does anyone have any questions at all about what I've just spoken about, about replicating real world scenarios in tests? Again, I'm not sure if we, um, we have any takers there so i think i'll move on to the next section which is offering multi-channel delivery um this 
basically allows candidates to sit tests um, where they want and potentially when they want as well. And this flexibility is achieved by offering the choice between test centres or delivery on site and then delivery directly into the candidate's home by remote proctoring. So in the past, tests have been delivered into test centres or into schools and universities um, quite often. Sorry, just bear with me. Excuse me. Um, often delivered into centres or into universities as seen in these images here. Now this has both positives and negatives, which we'll look at later. Here at BTL, we're quite well experienced with test centre delivery. We actually have our own uh, test centre network. Just a bit of information about that. We work with um, 44 different test centre suppliers. We have nearly 300 audited test centres worldwide uh, in over 100 different countries. And we're now the largest session based test centre network in the UK. So we conduct physical checks where we can on all these uh, the facilities, their access arrangements, and their technology, security, their invigilation processes and more. And it's also possible to utilize our secure client browser, um, the lockdown client, which blocks the candidate from being able to leave the test driver. And it also pre-downloads the test. So if there is an issue with the internet during the test, the candidate isn't affected whatsoever. We do recognize though that a lot of you are you know, from universities and would be more interested in delivering on campus instead. So the benefits of um, delivering on site or via test centers, um, I think would be that you have more control of the technology. Obviously within test centers, you can standardize the computers and the accessories that are used. So this helps ensure parity between the candidates. <coughs> um, the invigilators are in the same room as the candidate. This means that any problems that arise are more easily handled. And also, if you are using secure client, as mentioned previously, internet outages are not an issue. Excuse me. So those are some of the benefits. Some of the potential negatives or drawbacks. Um, if you pay for the use of a test centre network like BTLs, for example, they're typically more expensive than remote proctoring. If you're delivering on campus or on site into your own facility, then this obviously means that you have to maintain the machines, maintain the facilities, and all of that cost obviously adds up and adds to the logistical workload. Um, candidates have to travel to their centre, which could be a blocker, particularly for candidates that are based overseas. And as was quite pertinent over the last couple of years, delivery on site is not possible in the event of lockdown. So as mentioned before, multi-channel delivery is where you offer your candidates different options and that helps overcome some of these negatives. So as well as delivery into centers, the other offering as mentioned is remote proctoring. So you may call it um, online proctoring, online invigilation, remote invigilation, whichever you decide to call it, this allows candidates to sit tests at home using their own machines. And there are a number of different offerings on the market here. Next, I want to sort of mention what BTL have to offer in this regard. The first thing to note is um, that we actually introduced this a number of years ago, way before the pandemic, as one of our additional services. And we are entirely platform agnostic. We can integrate with essentially any remote proctoring supplier of choice. We already partner with a number of different remote proctoring providers and we have existing integrations there and experience again from before the pandemic. There's a number of different options available here, um, which includes having live proctors who are watching the tests as they happen, um, record and review services where the recordings of the assessment are viewed after the fact, and then AI where artificial intelligence monitors, uh, monitors the test um, rather than a human. And one of our solutions also features a second camera functionality, whereby the candidate uses their mobile phone as a second camera, which is placed off to one side, and thus provides the proctor a better view of the candidate's hands and provides more information about their surroundings and their environment. All of these offerings feature live support for candidates, and we also make sure to conduct a systems check before the exam, which ensures that the candidate has the technology required 
to sit their test. So the benefits of remote proctoring, cost. Um, in general, it is far cheaper than delivering into a test center network. There's no need for candidates to travel. Um, as mentioned before, this is particularly useful for candidates based overseas. And the actual candidate experience itself is improved. So a lot of candidates say that they are more comfortable and are able to perform to their full potential when they're at home. The drawbacks here, um, obviously it's going to be reliant on the candidate having a good internet connection. And obviously this is not guaranteed in, in most places in the world. Um, not all candidates will have the technology required to sit the test. Some might not have a computer or a laptop. Some might not have a mobile phone if the organization wants to use the second camera functionality. Um, now in our experience, technical issues are really quite rare but if they do occur, it's obviously not as simple to sort out um, remotely as it would be in a test centre. So there we have a summary of the benefits and negatives of remote proctoring. Um, I'm really interested to know if anyone is already using remote proctoring. Um, if so, if you could raise a hand in Zoom or perhaps leave a message in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, doesn't look like we're going to get any response there, but if anyone is already using remote proctoring, um, I imagine that the answers would have been quite different, uh, quite different a little over two years ago um, before the pandemic occurred. Um, next up, I'd like to look at an example of one of the organizations that uses um, multi channel delivery. So they're called RCPCH, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. They're a, a medical body and they focus on high stakes assessments and they're end to end users of Surpass. They deliver tests using both our test center network and via remote proctoring. So why did they choose multi-channel delivery? Um, primarily, they adopted remote proctoring uh, as an option of providing additional capacity to the test center network at times during the pandemic, um, obviously, social distancing affected how many test center seats were available. Um, also, there were times during the pandemic when centers were just entirely closed. Um, remote proctoring offered an option for them there. They knew though that they didn't want to go entirely with remote proctoring as they were aware that a lot of their candidates wouldn't be comfortable from home um, and would prefer to sit in a center. So, you know, some candidates prefer to sit at home and some prefer the center experience. How did they implement this? They went through our standard implementation, BTL's implementation, and we always encourage pilots. Now, in this case, the pilot of remote proctoring was successful enough to make RCPCH realize that they'd made the right decision. And once this decision was finalized, they focused on candidate communications. In, in our experience, candidate communications are paramount when it comes to successfully implementing remote proctoring. And RCPCH focused on updating their website. They provided a Q&A for their students. They delivered a webinar introducing remote proctoring to the candidates, and they also sent out emails to candidates to prepare them for the process. And they wanted to really focus on the prevention of malpractice, so implemented an internal audit system um, using volunteers from other teams within their organization. And they also, as part of implementation, realized that they wanted to offer female candidates the option to request a female invigilator. Um, so they managed to implement that as well. So what challenges did they face? Well, they've, they've actually said they expected a lot more technical issues than they experienced. Um, they've said that they've had a couple of candidates that experienced technical difficulties, but nowhere near as many as they anticipated. And they experienced an issue with correctly setting up separate test papers to run online invigilation. Um, so that's certainly something to be considered. In terms of the candidate's reaction, as a result over the last two years, there's an average of about 56% of their tests have been sat by a remote proctoring and about 44% have been sat in our test centers. So both very successful offerings. We've not seen one dominate the other, both are popular. 
And ACPCH has also pointed out that the remote proctoring is particularly popular for candidates, again, based overseas. So it really is one of the main benefits. So when we offer multi-channel delivery, um, that's to say we offer the candidate the choice to sit their test in a centre or on site or at home, we gain the benefits of both options. Um, when I personally first learned about remote proctoring, I assumed the vast majority of candidates would prefer to sit their tests at home, but we've learned that's not necessarily the case. In our experience, what we've learned from our customers, there's actually a relatively even split between the two options in terms of candidate preference. So offering, offering both is a great step towards making sure that candidates are as, as comfortable as possible during their tests and allowing them to perform to their full potential. <clears throat> now, if you combine the multi-channel delivery with on-demand testing, which a lot of our customers do, this really provides the candidates with just the maximum amount of flexibility possible. And when we first introduced remote proctoring, it was only in a very sort of specific use cases that organisations decided to utilise it. And this has obviously been massively altered by the pandemic, and which seems to have helped organisations realise the benefit of offering both options to their candidates. And as such, as time goes on, adopting a multi-channel multi delivery approach seems to be becoming more and more popular. We think it will become pretty much the norm when looking at the future of assessment. So to round off this section, really wanted to just ask if you currently um, offer both options of delivery. And if so, if you have a, a, an idea of your candidates' preferences, um, whether they prefer sitting their tests on site or in any test centres, or if they prefer having their test delivered to them via remote proctoring at home. Um, I'll pause just for a moment there, see if anyone answers. I can't see any answers coming in. So I will ask if anyone has any general questions on, on the subject of multi-channel delivery, please, please feel free to ask any questions that you have. And again, I think, I think we're questionless. Um, so I guess there we've been through some of the elements that we think will be a part of the future assessment and learning. Um, and I think it's time to return to the initial question, Georgie, would you agree? Yeah. So at this point, we wanted to open up the floor and get everybody's thoughts and opinions on the future of learning and assessment, where we're going in the future. As Paddy said, we've given you our thoughts. We want to hear yours. Um, based on the lack of interactivity throughout the rest of the session, I'm guessing we may need to leave it here, but we will stick around if anybody wants to have a chat. Can't see any chat messages and I can't hear any anybody else, so I guess thank you for the opportunity for us to present here. We've really enjoyed um, putting together our thoughts and presenting to you. Um, thank you to all the organizers of, of the GTEL conference. It, it's been amazing and, and you've done a really good job to organize it. So, so thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you everybody. All right, uh, thank you uh, everyone. So we are getting close to the end of our uh, time together. Uh, just have if there is uh, one thing you want to like uh, the audience uh, to take away from this uh, session, what would be uh, things that you want to do to share? That's a tricky question to summarize in uh, in a sentence. Paddy, do you have any thoughts? Um, my my main thought was um, regarding your first section, George, that you dealt with. If, if there are any organizations that are still reliant on pen and paper testing, we would really encourage just some exploration of on-screen testing because it, it really does open up the door to all future types of assessment. 
um, that, that would be one of the first things I would hope organizations take away. All yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, as a GTL, uh, uh, we are really appreciate your interest in this very important issues. Uh, just thank you again for your uh, sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Faggett. Okay. Glad to hear you. Okay, now we believe we're going to the next session. Right. Okay, okay right. Thank so, you for coordinating. Yeah, thank you. Guys. Glad to hear you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Suleiman? Yes. Yeah, hello. Uh, Dr. Mika, Mika, you can the next session. ما عم ما عندك مشكلة أوكي okay. uh, uh, مين اللي متحدثين speakers let me share uh, دقيقة yeah. الآن yeah. خلاص خلصنا من الموجودين الآن صح بس خلاص نقول لهم مع السلامة بس نقول لهم uh... Uh, uh, دكتور جورجي دكتور بيجي I believe uh, your session is end right yes, yes. Yeah. should we go yeah right. thank, thank you. you welcome thank you everybody طيب الوركشوب تو حيكون في عنا اللي هو ستودنت فيدباك انجيجمنت في ااا ساعه بعد ساعه yeah. صحيح hmm? بعد ساعه ما أنا ساعه تقريبا نعم تقريبا اي حنبدا okay. الساعه 4 5 وثلث انا عندي صح 5 وثلث الساعه 4 صح صح دكتور الساعه 4 صح دكتور ديفيد دكتور ايهم هلا شوف اللي عندي الوركشوب هلا اوكي طيب نستنيون حالا بس حتى كو هوست فهني بس يظهروا تقدر تعمل ابجريد من اتندي ل يعني ان اخرج ولا كيف؟ لا خليك معنا خليك معنا خليك معنا تمام انت لو بتلاحظ في عندك اتندي موجود على اليمين اذا بتفتح صفحه المشاركين معنا تمام في بانلست وفي اتندي ما في فيها البارتيسيبنت Panelist, وفي attendees, attendees uh, number zero. Okay, اضغط على participant. معلش اضغط على participant. تمام. Okay. سوينا بس. محتاج شيء؟
or the institution and how it contributes to the uh, improvement of the learning experience. Um, so uh, when we typically discuss this type of topic, a lot of people focus on the response rate and um, how many students have participated. Um, and there is not always that greater focus on engagement. Um, the presentation today is not to say that one is, is more important than other. It doesn't mean you ignore the response rate and focus engagement or vice versa, but rather it's a combination, uh, creating an environment where students believe that their feedback is uh, playing a key part in, in this journey. Um, so the agenda for uh, today's uh, presentation, uh, we're going to provide a quick overview about Explorance, who we are, who do we work with. Uh, we will then uh, highlight student engagement um, and, and what that really means. Uh, we will um, preview various feedback channels uh, when it comes you know, to uh, sharing uh, students' opinion. And then we will look also about uh, the importance of faculty and, and how they can play a big role or a big role in that engagement process. Uh, we will talk about different type of feedback, quantitative versus qualitative. And then we will move on to looking at how we can close uh, the feedback loop. How can we get back to students and show them that their feedback is really playing a key role. Um, and then uh, uh, the final topic really just uh, we look in the evolution of feedback from a continuous listening perspective and in a way what COVID has brought to us and, and kind of pushed us to think of new ways uh, of collecting feedback and that would hopefully give us the opportunity to move to a, a lifelong engagement. I will pause during the conference uh, during the presentation feel free to share any uh, questions you might have, uh, if you, uh, you you can use the chat or the Q&A function, I'll make sure to address these questions as we go along. All right, so first we're going to give a, a, a brief overview about Explorance. Um, uh, this is us, this is uh, Explorance typically as a team, we, we, get, we try to get everybody together at least once a year. Uh, this is from uh, the last uh, time we got together in, uh, prior to COVID um, in, in Montreal, Canada, uh, our team come from different locations. They come from uh, Chicago and other places in the United States. Uh, they, they come from uh, London in the UK and, and they come from Amman, Jordan. Uh, we have uh, an office in Chennai, India, and we also have an office in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we started back in 2003, um, and uh, our focus has been from day one about uh, student feedback, uh, looking in uh, how this feedback can play a big role in improving the student experience, looking at the student journey overall. Uh, we've had the pleasure to serve uh, uh, many institutions globally. Uh, we work with institutions in different countries. Uh, our platform is available in, in close to 30 languages. And we also have um, a, a primary focus in Saudi Arabia. We have many partners that we work with, uh, such as Saudi Electronic University, um, uh, King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, uh, King Faisal University, King Saud University, um, Prince Mohammed bin Salman College, uh, Battery Medical School and, and many others. Um, our focus on feedback also says it's not only about how we help our partners and, and the feedback that they collect from their stakeholders, which are students, the faculty, but we also listen to our employee. We create an environment, uh, uh, a positive environment for our employee. And uh, we've been voted as the best place to work for in Canada uh, last year. Uh, which is something we are very proud of because it, it was a challenging year when work shifted online and we had to make sure that uh, the well-being of our employees is, is always looked after because our employees serve our customers. So we believe by fostering an environment that helps uh, employees thrive uh, will contribute positively to, to innovation and, and to uh, better offering to our clients. We also have a very strong commitment to accessibility and equal access. So 
uh, we uh, comply uh, with standards such as WCAG uh, AA, or that's a rating that we received, which really means that even those students who are less fortunate, who might have certain disabilities, are able to utilize the system and share their voice. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have uh, one uh, uh, student or if you have a, a multiple students who uh, might need uh, special access. So we want to make sure we empower every voice in this journey. Um, we have a commitment to um, a social responsibility. So we undergo uh, assessment through uh, an organization uh, called Echo Vardis. Uh, we do get a rating on our uh, uh, social uh, responsibility from a sustainability perspective. And we try to make sure this is, goes back to, you know, making sure we're uh, contributing to the environment. We're using less paper. Obviously, as, as a, um, a software company, we want to make sure that as much of the task and the process workflow are, are completed online. Um, we have partnership with various organizations. Uh, IMS Global is a great example. Um, where we also want to make sure that uh, we understand what our customers are telling us, what is the industry telling us when it comes to uh, research methodology, having uh, uh, or enabling a student-centered learning, um, and, and so on. Um, so uh, we, we also contribute back to our user community. Our user community is called Blue Notes. Maybe some of you have heard about, about it or participated in it. Uh, we contribute annually uh, between 10 to 15 faculty research projects. Um, so we help our faculty in, in uh, pushing the boundaries around research, and we invite them typically to our global user conference in Chicago, uh, which happens in, in um, typically in the summer around late July, early August. Everyone is invited to participate in, in this conference and attend and um, hear what uh, other peers from different institutions and, and how they push the boundaries and talk about various best practices. Um, our next uh, item on the agenda is really to start discuss student engagement. Um, it's important first to reflect on the student journey in the academic institution. Um, students start as a freshman. Uh, it is their first post-secondary experience. They come in with a lot of excitement. They've probably done a lot of research. So it's important to capture that first impression, that enrollment experience. Uh, you know, how was it? How was their first term? How was their life? You know, uh, if they're going into, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an on-campus um, uh, residence, you know, how does that feel? How was their first experience being, in a way, as an adult system? Uh, lately, education has shifted to look into things such as a competency assessment, because what we know is we know how to measure technical skills. We know how to administer various exams to uh, uh, understand if a student obviously has passed or failed. This, these are the traditional measures that every institution would uh, typically pursue. But uh, what we also know is that education is really aiming at um, equipping students with the soft skills to be successful in the workplace. Uh, the reality is students uh, get hired for their tech, for their soft skills, maybe more than their technical skills. And that's why the interview process plays a key role for that uh, student. This is why many institutions have uh, programs where students maybe in the final year might uh, work on uh, certain projects, uh, might go and do an internship. So it's important to uh, bring in a realization, you know, do students understand what competencies the, that they are working on? What are their strengths and, and areas for development if they work in a peer environment? And this is where that competency assessment can help them better understand and better measure how they are developing these soft skills. Uh, we hear, hear from students as well about, you know, satisfaction with the university services, satisfaction with uh, uh, the, the various uh, uh, stakeholders that they engage with. We also could be hearing from faculty and staff about their overall satisfaction satisfaction with the e-learning platform, satisfaction with the registration, and, and so on. 
Um, and then, you know, we typically track, you know, when students graduate, we want to have an exit survey, obtain a program, feedback on the program that they've gone through, and we want to track students through throughout their career. Ideally, we want to hear back from alumni, see how successful they've been. The voice of the alumni really represents an ambassador for the institution. So it's important to keep that touch point, probably one of the hardest uh, 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 part is, is hearing back from alumni and, and making sure that uh, you, you keep that uh, communication going because they, they can play a pivotal role uh, in feeding back to the organization. We'll talk at the end about lifelong learning and what, what some other institutions have done. So along all of this, you know, do you see at the bottom here, we see that we're looking at different ways to collect that feedback. This could be a life formative feedback, continuous listening, personal improvement, and, and so on. Well, we will see some of these measures and opportunities. There are various KPIs that we can look into, and these KPIs can help guide our decision. You know, for example, um, sometimes you know you have students that drop midway through the course; they don't want to pursue uh, the final uh, exam. So, understanding why these students have dropped, as as little as that number might be, could be a critical component. Uh, because these students could be at-risk students. These are students that could potentially drop from the program. So it's important to listen really to every voice and, and motivate students to uh, uh, share their uh, concerns, their difficulties and challenges, because that can contribute directly uh, to the decisions that the institutions can make. Uh, obviously, having what, the reason we talk a lot about you know, uh, these measurements early on is because we want to uh, empower institution with the ability to look at leading indicators and not just look at lagging indicators. Lagging indicator is saying, well, you know, what grades did students have or how many students graduated from this program? But if I see students early on in their enrollment or then onboarding in their um, uh, in their course evaluation surveys, if I see there is a pattern and I can tackle that pattern, then I have a better chance of um, impacting uh, the lagging indicators. All right. Um, and this is, you know, we look at response rate versus response pattern. Uh, sometimes what's important is to have flexibility about when you collect that feedback. So, you know, in this case, let's say you administer a survey and, and you open that survey maybe for a, a two week period, you can track uh, uh, essentially how students are interacting with the survey, you know, what days or uh, of, of the week uh, that they typically respond. So here we see a correlation between a notification, which could be an email reminder, an SMS, uh, but we can see the correlation between the notification and how students respond back to the survey. We can find out the peak hours of the day or peak days of the week. Why is this important? You know, sending a reminder at the right time will make sure that you're also obtaining feedback uh, at the right time from the student. So you might send a reminder on a Friday. It's a holiday, but you know, students would see it. Maybe they respond from their email. They're more comfortable. They're sitting at their home. They might provide you with a better quality feedback. So we don't need to shy away and say, we only need to send this feedback during school hours, or we only need to send it during work days. That feedback can come in at any point. Uh, and we wanna provide that, that comfort to the student and flexibility to respond at any point. There is also the notion of summative versus formative feedback. Summative feedback, as we said, is the feedback that come at the end of a particular event, you know, it's the end of uh, the course, the end of the term, the end of the program at a graduation rate, once a year from a satisfaction perspective. But what about, you know, uh, students, when we think nowadays, they, they live in a digital world. In fact, COVID brought on to us the reality that, you know, there are online classes, there are uh, different touch points. And, and one of the key challenges that a lot of institutions face is engagement. So I know a student is sitting in an online class, just like now I am delivering this session online. I'm just not sure to what extent my, uh, the, the participant or the students that uh, I'm presenting to are actually engaged. Um, so 
uh, if I wait until, let's say, if I'm teaching a course and I'm waiting till the end of the term, I'm only going to hear at the end of the term. And guess what? There is not a lot of opportunity for me to go back and make changes or benefit those students. But if there are ways to obtain formative feedback, formative feedback could mean, you know, um, I get, I run a pulse survey. Um, I hear my students. I, um, maybe the, the, the institution would run a midterm evaluation. And this gives me the opportunity to, to actually go back and, and improve or adjust because I know then as an instructor that I, I can also impact my uh, summative rating or my end of term rating. So what we're saying here is we're not saying one is more important to the other, rather we're saying it complements each other. Formative feedback, just like you do formative assessment in school uh, is an indicator to what the summative assessment might be. And that's why listening to students more often is important. And if we're gonna listen to them more often, we cannot just think of response rate. Sometimes a voice of a single student, as we will see uh, a bit later, uh, would matter because we can make an impact on that individual student life. And that for any institution is definitely considered a positive impact. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a minute to see if anybody has any question before we talk about the feedback channel. Um, we will talk about how the, the availability of various feedback channel also um, help students in um, uh, contributing their, their uh, opinions or sharing their opinions more frequently. Okay, um, just a reminder, you can use the, the chat uh, function within Zoom or you can use the uh, Q&A function within Zoom if you have any questions. All right. Um, so next we will talk about uh, the uh, feedback channels. Now, one very traditional way is the email notification. Uh, we send emails to remind students. Um, these notifications, obviously, it's important that we customize them. What happens is sometimes, you know, you take the same email and you just resend it. And what the students see see that, you know, yes, it's the same survey, I'm going to respond to it later, or I'm tired of seeing that same email. So how we customize the email, how we probably brand the email with the institution theme, how we maybe list the, the you know, in this case, if it's a course evaluation, I, you know, your feedback is really required for these different courses. Maybe the email can come from um, an important, uh, you know, person in the program, maybe it can come from the dean, Maybe it can come from the president. Doesn't mean they necessarily can respond back to them, but it can show that the president is expressing the importance of you know, uh, hearing the student feedback. So there are a lot of techniques to customize that emails. No two emails should be the same uh, because if they are the same, it just means chances are the student, if they've not reacted to the first one, they will not react to the second one. So having the ability to customize these emails is really very important. And then looking at um, how, you know, we know students spend a lot of time on learning management systems. Uh, you know, um, many of you in Saudi Arabia use Blackboard, other institutions might use Moodle and, and so on. But making sure that uh, as a student and faculty, we both spend a lot of time in uh, the LMS, you know, so maybe when a student log in, when it's time to provide feedback, I actually can make sure that feedback pop up to them directly inside uh, Blackboard and that they're able to provide this feedback and, and uh, react to it right away. Maybe I can have a building block inside that reminds students. So really a lot of different natural ways where a student, when they feel it's the right time to provide a feedback, they can provide feedback. Uh, the availability of the feedback through mobile device, whether it's a mobile app or whether it's uh, something that they can open and becomes mobile friendly. Um, we, we actually see probably uh, a good percentage, I'd say at least 30% of the feedback that institutions collect can come from mobile devices. Now that gets you to think as well as, you know, it's, it's a lot of students are providing feedback from the mobile Maybe I also want to make sure my questionnaire is more compact. My questionnaire is not very long because when I complete feedback through a mobile device, I don't have the same screen size. I might not necessarily have 
uh, uh, let's say the, the uh, uh, same time or the same attention span when I'm in a mobile versus when I am uh, accessing this or providing that feedback through my computer or desktop. <clears throat> Um, how about QR code uh, functionality to um, be able to, you know, show a QR code as students maybe at the end of the class, scan this QR code, provide your feedback. Maybe that QR code can be distributed in, in many uh, different uh, places within the university. Maybe it can, uh, that QR code can be available in, in the library, in the cafeteria, but you brand, you know, the, the, uh, the feedback channel that you're trying to uh, encourage. So you might say it's student voice at my university, your voice, you know, um, every uh, uh, voice count. You wanna use these expressions. You wanna brand the feedback, um, uh, uh, the, the feedback initiative to make sure that students really see that this is their opportunity to make their voices heard. Uh, what's equally important as well is to make sure that you can engage faculty. Now, faculty obviously play a critical role. Faculty are on the other end. Faculty um, are the ones who will uh, deliver the education, motivate students, make an impact on the student life. So we want to make sure also that faculty have that opportunity. Uh, they can go, um, let's say, through Blackboard or through the LMS um, and potentially track response rate without jeopardizing confidentiality. Now, research indicates that um, if faculty have the opportunity to explain the uh, importance of feedback to the student and provide students with um, the time to share this feedback online, not only will uh, there will be a higher response rate, but the quality of the feedback would be higher as well. So faculty can come and, and display that QR code or faculty can take, you know, the last 10 minutes of, of maybe the last class or the class before the last and explain to students how their feedback can personally impact the faculty or how it's used by the faculty to benefit the students and why their voices is important because in many cases, students don't get to see uh, the reports of that feedback back. Uh, what's, uh, I think there's a, a one example from Erhus University in Denmark. What, what they did is they said, we know research have indicated that the uh, availability or the, uh, of faculty or, or the role that the faculty can play in encouraging students is very important. So we're gonna ask a parallel question in the course evaluation that is answered by faculty. That question asks the faculty and say, did you give five or 10 minutes in class? Did you explain to students the uh, importance of feedback? And based on that, they would correlate the results to see faculty who said yes, that they've given time. Um, how did it impact the response rate and how did it impact the quality of the feedback or uh, the uh, uh, feedback rating in general, did it yield to a higher feedback? And they would do the same thing. Faculty also took the time to explain why the feedback is important, what was the impact on the results. Um, we also see institutions, they say, well, how about, you know, we, we know that typically every university have a set of questions that they want to measure, they want to ask about the effectiveness of the teacher. We they want to ask about uh, uh, the learning environment. They want to ask about the course, the course material, and, and so on. If it was an online course, they want to ask about uh, the online experience. If there was a lab or tutorial, they want to obtain feedback uh, on that as well. Um, but what if I give faculty the opportunity to have a, a maybe a question bank? You know, maybe certain faculty they uh, invite a guest speaker or. Uh, they follow a different methodology, they bring in more case study, or they maybe do more peer work. But the standard questions that are typically asked in, in the end of term course evaluation do not necessarily allow them to measure uh, these initiatives. So if I allow faculty to add one or two questions, three questions to a, uh, from a bank or from basically allowing them to type in their question to be amended with the end of course evaluation, then I also have 
the opportunity to uh, allow them to measure and obtain additional feedback which could benefit this faculty directly. So given these opportunities to faculty can really play a big role. And then I also want to make sure I'm sharing timely reports with faculty. Uh, for faculty to be able to uh, act on the feedback that they receive, they need to see that feedback. We understand that you know you might not want to share the feedback until the faculty have uh, submitted the final grades. So yes, this is this is quite important. Uh, but you know, to do so, you want you you can also have a trigger set up to say that you know when faculty submit their final grades, then they can have access to view. Uh, their report, but allowing them to view these reports, allowing them to see the feedback while it's fresh would uh, also help them in taking action to improve for the next class. Uh, that feedback can come in the form of reports. That feedback should also be available in a form of a, and that feedback should also reflect a trend. So not only how well you've done, let's say in this term, or what was your feedback this term, but maybe since you started teaching at the institution, how does your feedback looks like? You know, what's the trend? Is there an improvement trend or not? Maybe I can have a, a BI system that would allow me to say, well, you know, this is my overall feedback for all the courses of teach. I started very high, then I've had a dip in this feedback. What happens here? Is it all the courses that I taught or is it a specific course? So this, you know, by having that BI capability to uh, dissect the data, it gives me the opportunity to understand that feedback better. Um, we see there are certain questions that typically come up and we, we, some institutions say, well, should the feedback continue after the final exam? Uh, so different institution, you different methodology. Now, Many institutions prefer to open the feedback three to four weeks before the end of the term and then stop it before the final exam. They don't want the feedback to be uh, basically negatively impacted or screwed by uh, the experience in the final exam because a student who might provide feedback after the final exam is you know, only reflecting on how well they've done in the exam. So we see many institutions prefer to do it before. They wanna make sure that the student reflecting on the entire terms experience prior to the final exam. We also see some institutions that they administer a, a midterm evaluation. So the midterm evaluation is, you know, maybe a shorter evaluation. It's, it's a, a, a shorter touch point where I am looking for feedback. Maybe I don't have to ask the same questionnaire. I could ask three or four questions just to see if there are any concern, if there is anything that I, I need to measure or gauge. And as a faculty, if I hear these things early on, it can help me and, and, and it can help me close the loop back with students to say, you've expressed so and so, maybe I you know, don't, uh, um, let's say, grade uh, the assignment quickly, or maybe I don't have enough examples, or maybe I could share more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 let's, uh, actual case studies to um, emphasize the learning. So the more I can hear from students, in a structured way, obviously the better for me and the better for the institution, because you as, a, 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 let's say a quality assurance department and e-learning department, you are interested overall, uh, how do students uh, reflect on the online experience? How do students in certain programs reflect? Is there a, a, an outlier between student feedback coming from male versus female or students from local versus expat? So aggregately, you're, you're interested in the same analysis, maybe not on a course by course basis like the faculty does, but on a program level or school level or at a university level. Okay, I'm just gonna take another pause here. I wanna see if uh, there are any questions uh, before we move into uh, a very important topic around qualitative versus uh, quantitative rating. So uh, we are now talking about uh, feedback uh, uh, methodologies or the different type of feedbacks. Um, typically feedback, there's a lot of emphasis on quantitative analysis. I wanna ask questions that can be rated. I wanna take this rating and 
uh, accordingly. I, I, you know, it's easy for me to calculate. The system can find out averages. I can compare ratings from different programs, departments, and, and so on. Uh, and there is typically little emphasis on qualitative rating. Both ratings are very important, uh, but we don't see a lot of emphasis on the open-ended feedback. So we're going to take an example from an actual institution, and they shared their experience, and both from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. The feedback in this case is looking at the lecturer or the instructor. And if you see this feedback, it's, it's divided into different sections. So the first four questions are looking at planning and organization, demonstrating good knowledge, stimulating thinking. Essentially, it is looking at planning and execution of the feedback. The uh, second part of this feedback is looking at attitude towards students. And the final part is looking at class management. So every question from this institution perspective represents an important behavior that uh, the lecturer should demonstrate while teaching the class. Question 10, look at the overall. Question 11 and 12 are open-ended feedback. Question 11, look at you know, um, uh, something uh, that the lecturer has done really well, so a positive attribute. And question 12, look at uh, improvement opportunities. So what we've done is, is we looked at initially the quantitative analysis with this institution. And uh, they use a four point scale. So they use uh, strongly disagree, disagree, and agree and strongly agree. They did not use a neutral, which could be neither agree nor disagree. And if you see the distribution of the results here, and along with the color code at the top, you can see in general that there is a high degree of agreement. So the agreement here just excuse these lines here, but the agreement, what it's showing is typically we have over a 95% agreement between students who have rated the questions as agree or strongly agree. There is very little on the disagreement scale. In fact, if you look at question 10's average, which is out of four, you can see it almost represents the first nine question, even though question 10 is rated separately. So quantitatively, what students are telling me is everything is going well. We're extremely happy with the lecturer. Um, and we're, they're assessing the uh, three different categories that the uh, instructor should demonstrate, planning and execution, attitude towards student, and class management. So when you see that data and you see term over term, this quantitative rating is very high, then you, you also think, okay, where are the opportunities for improvement? Because I, I see very few students who could potentially have a, a dissatisfaction or indicate dissatisfaction in, in their teaching experience. And then we said, let's look at question 11 and 12. And this is where a text analytic tool uh, that can allow us to automate open-ended feedback. It doesn't matter which language the feedback is in. Uh, we can take feedback and run auto translation and essentially look at the most talked about themes. Now, what's important here is not we're looking for keywords. We're not saying what did the sentence say or what did the student say? We're looking at expressions. So in this case, we built uh, a, a teaching and learning dictionary. And this teaching and learning dictionary has um, about 60,000 different expressions that are mapped into about 60 themes. So in a student comment, they might say, I really like the course, or the course was you know, very exciting. Uh, and that got categorized you know, under maybe, you know, if it's, I really liked it, goes under interesting, exciting goes under interesting. They might say the instructor was always you know, helpful, supportive, available and so on, and that can go under supportive. Um, they might say that, you know, I, I was always able to ask questions to the instructor, the instructor is approachable, and so on. So in this case, for this institution, they had 
15,000 students, about, I'd say, over 20,000 different comments on the different courses, because each student can have up to six courses. And I can see clearly that students are expressing satisfaction with uh, instructor helpfulness, being kind or personable, clarity around instruction, engaging, and so on. If you look into this and say, if I plugged in, let's say 20,000 comments, about 11% of the comments indicate helpful or supportive, because what I want to know is what are the general themes? You can read 10, 15, 20 comments, but as you start going into 50, 100, 200, and so on, it's difficult for you to say, well, yes, I read the comments, I understood them, but what categories do they indicate? What areas should I focus on? And this is where a text analytic dictionary can help you uh, achieve that. At the same time, we're looking at the improvement opportunity. If you remember, we said there weren't a lot of dissatisfied students because the a quantitative rating indicated over 95% satisfaction. But guess what? When I asked for improvement opportunities, I was still able to capture while in a small scale, certain improvement that are important. Guess what? We talked about the at-risk students. These are students that are typically, if you look at the big picture and you look at quantitatively, these students will be missed. But these are the students that could drop out. And these are the students that I need to pay attention to. What we've done is we've mapped. We said, here are the quantitative questions with all the be behaviors um, and the effectiveness that the lecturer need to demonstrate. And on the right-hand side are the attributes or the themes that were highlighted from the text analytics uh, from question 11 and 12. What we've done is we said in blue, these are the um, attributes that were highlighted in the student comments. So everything in blue means that students uh, expressed a similar interest or, or highlighted the importance of this criteria in their open-ended feedback. What that tells you is when a student say in their comments that the lecturer helped me in my thinking, motivated me uh, to, to have better uh, uh, ideas, uh, basically stimulating that thinking, the instructor was always available, I could reach out to him, I can ask them question. This tells you qualitatively that the feedback is really important, that this is an engaged student, because when people type in their comments, you know, you, you rest assured this is 100% quality feedback versus student who might just put a rating. It doesn't mean that the rating is, is false. It's just when you're rating multiple questions here, it could mean that students might not be clearly reading every question. Now, the, the, the attributes or the elements in orange indicate that these comments were not highlighted uh, or the, these uh, uh, attributes were not talked about in, by the students in their comment. It doesn't mean that they're not necessary. It just it means that students either did not find them important or the student did not observe sufficient behavior from the lecturer to be able to categorize this or identify these attributes in, in their comments. So I'm just gonna pause for a minute to see if, if you have any questions. The next thing we're moving to here, so we're saying, What's the balance between qualitative and quantitative analysis? Uh, how many comments do we uh, basically think are important versus comments? You know, we feel that let's focus on you know quantitative uh, analysis versus qualitative. Obviously, we know because we care a lot about response rate, we look into quantitative analysis or quantitative questions. That's why we have more of those. But when we think of feedback, open-ended feedback, we're thinking of student engagement, we're thinking of quality of feedback. And accordingly, this is what helps me, you know, to uh, say, listening to student, having the tool that can help me with the text analytics to say, there's gonna need to be a balance between qualitative and quantitative because qualitative feedback definitely is an indicator of higher engagement. So we ask and we say, 
you know, would you be willing to start a feedback process by asking an open-ended question? Why do we leave them all the way until the end? What if you ask a student, and we know students can type faster than they can write, what if we ask and say, what were the most positive aspects about this experience? And, and then we let that, you know, whether they want to provide feedback or how much qualitative feedback they want to provide, but we let that guide the quantitative analysis. So these are some of the opportunities for institution that, you know, to be able to, to leverage this and, and, and run it accordingly. Um, what's an acceptable response rate? Well, there is also something scientific that uh, you can incorporate here, which you can look at something called the reliability index. Uh, basically, a reliability index uh, is uh, a, a, a measurement that look at the bound of error of estimation uh, for elementary survey sampling. Now, there are different equations that would allow you to measure reliability index. This is one of the equation we utilize. It allows you to control basically a coefficient. It allows you to, you know, it looks at the number of responses and it looks at the response, the, the audience or the response size. So when it combines these things together, accordingly, you're going to be able to get an index which tell you is the data or the responses you receive are statistically sufficient. What it means here really, if you have a class of 50 students, 30% response rate is not bad. But if you have a class of 10 students, 30% response rate is not good. So these are some of the elements that people need to take into consideration. Um, we're going to move next into closing the feedback loop. And uh, this is one area very, uh, I'd say, uh, contentious or controversial area where a lot of people are not necessarily sure, you know, why can't institutions share results back with students? And this is why also students say, well, I, I said this instructor is not great, you know, I did not like this instructor, why are they still teaching? Um, obviously, this is where students might feel their feedback is not important, why it's important to close the loop. But what students don't know is actually their feedback um, plays a critical role for faculty. In fact, feedback at many institutions um, can play a role into their tenure and promotion because uh, faculty and, 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 and the university in general looks at students' report for the past three years and how students perceive them as one of the measures for, for tenure and promotion. Many faculty, many expats in uh, the region here might have their contract renewal tied to uh, the uh, feedback as well. Uh, basically, it's one of the measures that are looked at. So these are very important uh, criteria uh, uh, that uh, students are, do not realize because they don't see it. So can you share results with back with students? Some universities do. UCLA Anderson, they do that. They share results back in full transparency and tell students you can even use these results to, for your registration. It doesn't mean that every institution need to do this, but you have the opportunity maybe to share, say these are the top concerns that you've expressed. And this, these are the actions that we're going to take about it. So it doesn't have to be feedback about every student. It could be aggregate feedback overall. Um, there is also a new trend that we see uh, happening, which is student self-assessment. <clears throat> As part of any feedback process, maybe even an end of course evaluation, you can ask student and say, uh, Basically, how would you rate yours? What was your behavior in this class? Um, how frequently did you collaborate with your peers? How frequently did you uh, reach out to your instructor as our classroom? How frequently did you seek additional resources? Um, how frequently did you study? And when, you, when students rate themselves, the opportunity there is to generate a report and say, this is your self-assessment report. And this is how your self-rating, this is how your uh, approach and behavior in this course 
compares to other students who have taught the same course. So you're basically what you're looking at here is you're saying, this is my self rating. This is how I, I approach this course. And this is how my classmate did. So if I see I did not collaborate with my peers and many of them did, or I did not seek additional resources, I know there is a missed opportunity. I know for my next class, these are important elements that I need to emphasize on. So this is another great way to close the loop without really saying how the instructor was rated or what was their feedback. And this also can uh, uh, play a, a, an important role for those institutions that provide advisory for a student because advisors can look at these reports and can help students in, in looking, as we said, competency assessment and helping students in uh, tackling certain skills or competencies that they can improve. Um, we're moving into the final topic or the final section of, of the presentation, which is continuous listening. Um, as I said earlier, I said, you know, when we discuss formative assessment, I said, well, you know, we always gather feedback traditionally at the end of a term, maybe midway through the term, one student graduate, maybe once a year about uh, uh, their satisfaction about services and so on. But a lot of things happen <clears throat> during the term with online. We did not even know if students are engaged. They're attending the class. Are they listening? Are they participating? Uh, what happens in their life? Are there topics that they don't understand? Uh, these, in fact, are typical. I, I, my kids, although they're still K-12, but it's one of the challenges where they're also encountered when they had to study for a year and a half online is that they were not necessarily always engaged, but there was no way to understand that. There was no way for the faculty to measure this. And then you're only looking at lagging indicators, which is their grades, their, their assessments, and you wonder why you know, did student miss this topic or did not understand that topic and what they could have done differently. So these are opportunities here to be able to uh, utilize a tool a social feedback tool, we call it Blue Pulse, where you can create a mobile app and have students and faculty engage in real time. So faculty can not just necessarily ask a survey, but just maybe post a video about a learning topic and see what students say about it. Um, you might maybe ask a question about a new initiative. You want to bring in a guest speaker or, you know, there's going to be advisory. How do you perceive that? How important it is? Maybe you encourage your student to attend this conference and you want to see what topics they were going to be most interested in so you can guide them. Or maybe you're going to provide an extra session or office hour and you want to see who's going to participate. It could be for the institution as well and say, you know, we're going to have back to, uh, to university policy and new guidelines around COVID um, or potentially just, you know, we're launching a new initiative at the university. We're having, uh, you know, uh, uh, extended hours for the library. We, we're going to have the university maybe provide additional services. How do you perceive that? Why do I have to wait till the end of the term to get your feedback? If I have an opportunity to know now, then I can tweak, take actions, adjust in real time. And this is where this continuous listening really play a very, very important role because you give an opportunity for faculty, not, it's, that doesn't mean it's for all faculty, but those faculty that embrace technology, those faculty that are using a combination of Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, email, survey, and so on, is to say, well, let me have a uniform platform that is gonna allow me to administer formative assessment um, and download evidence about all the work that I do. And not necessarily just look into well, what you know, what were the uh, grades, what was the the um, uh, pattern of the grades, or what are the project that the students submitted. Let me help them in real time, engage them more because that's definitely going to help in uh, not only improving the quality of education but ensure that students um, can achieve the the intended learning outcome of the course. <clears throat> You might say, well, as we administer all these social media tools or we administer 
pulse survey or pulse feedback, whether quantitative or qualitative, how do we measure all this data? Well, there are machine learning tools nowadays that automatically categorize feedback. This is an example of a machine learning tool called BlueML that can take all this feedback. See here, it took 20,000 comments. It categorized them, said these are positive, about 91%, 9% are negative. There are some recommendations. So you can immediately look into categories. So you can start going inside these categories and uh, reading them accordingly. So this gives you not only words in it, well, it's yes, continuous listening, but also continuous analysis. We need to pair the continuous listening with the analysis and not say we're just collecting data. We have this data, we can analyze them whatever we want. No, you wanna be able to analyze that data in real time as well. Um, I just wanna conclude and wrap up and say there are many institutions that are moving towards lifelong learning. Um, in a way, National University of Singapore is a great example. You never really graduate, you know? So you simply, when you finish your degree, you've taken the first step uh, uh, towards a, a lifelong journey, towards your association with the, your university. You're really just going into the next phase, which is you're going into the workforce, but you never really stop learning. I think with today's advancement in, in technology, uh, probably a lot of us are, are uh, uh, still uh, naive in, in some of the latest trends that are coming. In fact, a lot of us try to keep up or, or keep the pace uh, when it comes to learning and adopting new technologies. And we see the young gener generation who come in at a, a very fast pace and adapt to a lot of different tools. Uh, we need to make sure that all of us have the opportunity to learn and, and you know, starting with our students. So if the students embrace that mentality that I'm always going to learn, if I am measuring their experience, if I had impacted their journey, not only through response rate, but through engagement, then what you can uh, bet on is that the student is gonna come back and student is going to be able to, um, uh, pursue additional, you know, uh, uh, maybe higher education or continuous education uh, to work on their competencies, new skills, and always continue to be an ambassador of the institution. Uh, this this concludes the the presentation for today. I'm just going to open it up to see if we have any questions uh, from uh, the participants uh, before we close this session. Okay. Uh, thank you, Samer, for your uh, time. Uh, we really uh, uh, do appreciate uh, your interest uh, in this very important topic. Uh, just we get in, uh, since we are getting to the end of uh, our time together, uh, just saying if there is one thing you want to like uh, the audience uh, to take away from the session, what you think would be? Uh, uh... Yeah, um, that's really a good question. You're right. We've we've addressed a lot of different things. Uh, wh what I would say is, I say when you look at feedback results, when you look at data, um, just think that the key measure here is impact. Uh, it's what what the impact is. And, and you want students also, you want everybody to think of impact. The more you think of impact, then it doesn't matter whether you're impacting one or, or multiple students. As we said, you might find one student through that feedback journey who are dropping the course and they're being very loud. You know, they want somebody to listen to them. And you're able to capture that feedback and you're able to have a positive impact on that student, uh, you know, not to lose, not to drop off the program or, or you know, uh, have to pursue something, uh, uh, another degree, then really I say, we have to measure our accomplishment by the impact we have. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, appreciated. 
uh, I think we are just uh, finish our uh, sessions. Uh, I thank you again uh, for your time. And thanks for the audience for uh, listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Sleiman, for uh, providing us with the opportunity to present at your conference. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. مهندس علاء استاذ علاء
We're excited to be here. Thank you, Krista. All right. So before we get started in sharing our information, we would like to hear from our participants. What do you know about accessibility? Like what is your familiarity with that concept, especially in higher education? So we will give a moment for you to share within the chat feature your thoughts. It looks like that um, one attendee shared being able to be reached um, in a, it looks like maybe a private message, um, which I think is a fantastic answer. Wonderful, excellent. Uh, any other thoughts as well? I'm not seeing any more in the chats. So we'll just give it another moment in case anybody's typing and then we'll move on. Um, if I may speak for myself, Amy, I feel like accessibility means that each student can do what they're being asked to do in the time frame that they need to do it at the same standards as everyone else um, and to be able to do the same things independently. Um, I think it's important that people have the maybe have, have the same opportunity to succeed or fail as everyone else. I agree. I think that's a, a wonderful thought on um, accessibility is that it's not about like special permissions, but leveling the playing field, bringing everyone to the same level so that they can succeed or fail on their own merit rather than circumstances of their birth or or life. All right. So not seeing any others, I'll move on. So just to give some examples of different kinds of special needs or disabilities, you know, there are a wide range. This is certainly not all of them, but being deaf or hard of hearing, having a limited gait, limited ability to walk or range of motion, being paralyzed, uh, having a speech or language disorder, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, different kinds of learning disabilities. So things that are um, invisible, you know, not easy to see, not easy to define. Uh, visual impairments, health conditions. So these different kinds of health conditions can have a wide variety of impacts. Students that will change how they need to interact with information in order to truly understand the material and be able to demonstrate that understanding. And some of these come and go, some are permanent, um, some will get worse with time, some may improve with time. So there's just a wide variety of needs that may be met um, through Ally and through increased flexibility with formats and access. So another way to think about these different types of access needs is to think of it on a continuum. So it's not black and white, you know, either you can or you can't. There is a wide range of abilities to do so. So being able to see, 
you know, you may not have great vision, you may be like me and need contacts or glasses uh, in order to really be able to interact with the world, or you may not need any sort of visual aids at all. Uh, different abilities to hear, whether it's out of both ears or one ear, being able to walk, read, write, communicate verbally, uh, tune out distractions around you, and managing your physical and mental health. So these are all things more on a range of abilities rather than just a binary system. But it also goes beyond disability. And these are different groups of students that we really feel Ally can help. And these are all different groups of students that you commonly see in higher education. So in addition to individuals with different types of disabilities, so those visible disabilities, like somebody using a wheelchair, the invisible disabilities, like learning disorders, or um, like mental health, temporary disabilities, you know, you break your dominant hand, it's going to make it more difficult to interact, or maybe an athlete with a concussion. Um, but also, your international students, or students who are attending school in their non native language, professionals seeking more education. So individuals who may have careers going on while they are also attending school. Your students accessing the material with different types of technology. So not everyone may be using a computer at all times to interact with the learning materials they have. More and more students are utilizing their phones as their primary device for accessing online content. And so that online content needs to be usable by that mobile device. First college student in their family, maybe not having the background and support. Parents or people taking care of other family members in the home. And your commuters, students who have long drives or have to use public transportation to get to and from school. So these are all groups that may have different needs of access. So not just about disability, but also about life circumstances. And we believe that Ally can really help to meet the needs of these individuals by giving them greater flexibility in how they access their materials. So another question for our participants, why is it accessibility important to you? So if you're sharing your message in chat, please feel free to continue to do so. Um, Krista added her answer to the chat, so I will read that up. Accessibility is important to me because I want to create a world that I can fully access when I am 90 years old. I do not want age to limit what I can do with my life. So yes, that's another consideration when you're thinking about access and disability is that as we age, we just naturally have more needs for access. And so by designing things more accessibly now, we make things easier for our own future selves. Accessibility is important to me because I believe that individuals with different needs may have great contributions to make to society and they may be able to really help move things you know forward create new advancements in science and technology but 
because of difficulties of access, they're not able to demonstrate and learn the things they need in order to create those new advances. In chat, we have somebody sharing, because I found difficulties while teaching students not native to English. Yes. So accessibility is important in, for uh, individuals who are learning in their non-native language, because that's another barrier that they are having to cross in order to understand what you're trying to teach them and show you what they have learned. Thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate that. All right. Krista sharing. Oh, Krista sharing uh, an example in chat as well. So everyone has contributions and inaccessible content limits what others can do. A deaf blind woman is now an attorney and contributing to the accessibility cause. And there's a link in the chat to Haben Gurma, uh, her webpage. And she is an advocate and was the first deafblind woman to earn her degree from, it's escaping me right now, Krista, was it Harvard or Yale? Harvard. Yeah, Harvard. Harvard. Okay. So, yes, a, a wonderful accessible, uh, a wonderful example of what individuals can do when they have the right access. All right. So I've mentioned a couple times that we feel that Ally is an excellent tool for increasing that access. So what is it? <laughs> so Ally is a tool that integrates into your learning management system, whether you use Blackboard Learn, uh, Instructure Canvas, D2L Brightspace, et cetera. Um, and it increases access and awareness. Oh, we have another one sharing in chat. As an educator, to make sure knowledge is delivered to all types of learners, fulfilling the intended goals. Yes, for a reason, accessibility is important. You know, as an educator, you want your students to do well when they're putting in the effort. And so having that flexibility makes sure that you're reaching your students and they have the ability to demonstrate their learning back. Thank you very much. So Ally has essentially three pillars to its usage. So the first is the student facing pillar, and that is the alternative formats. So Ally will automatically create alternative formats of documents within your learning uh, environment. So the instructor uploads you know, a Word document or a PowerPoint, and then the student will be able to choose another file format to access that information. And that gives them the flexibility to access it in the way that is best for them. The second pillar is the instructor feedback. So it gives instructors information on the accessibility of the content that they are putting into their LMS and also gives tips on how to improve that. So it doesn't just make you aware of potential barriers. It also gives guidance on how to fix those barriers. And then the institutional report is the third pillar. So believing that using data for how often people are accessing Ally and how often fixes to content are being made um, is really seen as important for helping everyone move forward to a more accessible future. So to begin with, I'm going to be going the, over the alternative formats offered by Ally. So the alternative formats tool provides students with options in how they engage with their course content, supports different learner needs, and also preferences, abilities, and what devices they're using. So they could switch between different operating systems, for example. Also, 
having those different formats gives options for offline access to those materials. So considering, for example, your commuters, they could turn a Word document into an MP3 file and just listen to that required reading in the car or on the bus. And it allows for unlimited downloads of the different alternative formats. So students could choose different formats on different days, just depending on how their needs are changing. So it really gives your students the options to engage with the materials in the ways that they need to. Within different learning management systems, the icon looks ever so slightly different. In Learn, Ultra, D2L, and Moodle, a new little icon will appear. It looks kind of like an A with a downward arrow next to it. In Canvas, it adds another option to the download menu next to the file formats. That's alternative formats. So it makes it easy for students to find and use. There are plenty of different file format options, and we'll go over these in more detail during my demo portion. Uh, but this is just a screenshot of the kind of list that might come up for students when accessing the alternative formats. All right, so I'll be switching over to my demo environment for a moment. Um, but within these slide decks, we have created a slide for each of the different file formats and how they can be useful to different groups of students. So even without the demo, you know, you will have this kind of information available to you. So I'm going to stop my sharing for a moment so I can switch. Um, but if any questions have come up so far while I'm switching over, please feel free to put them into the chat. And I saw something come up in chat. Okay. All right. Um, and we just got that uh, not everyone has access to the chat. And yes, we, uh, so there are some individuals who have interaction access and some who are just watching live. So uh, I hope that everyone who's watching live is still getting things. And that's why we're reading out the information from chat as well to ensure that those of you who are joining us streaming instead are still able to get that information piece. All right, so hopefully now you are seeing my demo environment. Um, I am currently using Blackboard Learn with Ultra Navigation. So whatever LMS your school uses, your institution uses may be a little bit different, but the features of Ally look the same within the different environments. So once we get into the alternative formats list and the instructor feedback, which Krista will be demonstrating later, um, that will all look the same no matter what learning management system you use. So in my content, you can see next to this first reading, there is that little A icon with the downward arrow next to it. Uh, actually, give me one moment and I will switch to student preview because an important difference is that when you are an instructor, Ally gives you some additional information with the file content that your students do not see. So I will access it as a student would. If I go into my alternative formats, um, this is for the uh, actual content post, but I will find instead, let's do this one. So I find a Word document and open that up and it will give me a list of possible format options that I can use. So the first option is a tagged PDF. 
This file format may be useful for students who need to access content offline and perhaps don't have um, Word on whatever machine they will be using. It also may work better with some types of technology used by individuals with disabilities. So it just gives a little more of that option. So students are able to enlarge, you know, everything that a PDF can do, the student is now able to utilize. Whenever a student accesses an alternative format of your content, it does not make any changes to your content as an instructor. It is just converting it into a different file format. The next option is an HTML file, so turning it into a web page. Again, this can be very useful for students using different kinds of devices to access their information. An HTML page may work much better on a student's phone than a Word document or a PDF. It is also very nice because it is easy for a student to enlarge this information and it will adapt the text and wrap it so that more of it fits on the screen even at the larger sizes and this is nice over a pdf because with a pdf yes you can make it very large but at some point you're going to have to start scrolling side to side in order to see all of that information. With an HTML file, you don't have to do that. Or at least you can get it much bigger before you have to start doing that. So useful for individuals with low vision or students who are just they, they're tired of looking at a screen. And so making it a little bit bigger might make it a little easier to access. Also, again, HTML files tend to work better with many types of assistive technology than a traditional Word document or even a PDF file. So I'll go back to my Learn page and my alternative formats. The next file format offered by Ally is the EPUB or an ebook file format. This works very well on ebook readers such as Kindles or Nooks. Um, many browsers have built in EPUB reading uh, options. But we have another one that we like that we'll share. It is called Thorium Reader T H. O-R-I-U-M, and this is a free EPUB reading software. For those of you with access to chat, Krista has put it into the chat as well. Um, Thorium Reader is by E-D-R-L-A-B, E-D-R-Lab.org. Uh, so if you are interested in looking at it, sharing it with your students, it's one that we do highly recommend. So I will open that up. And it's not a Blackboard product. We don't run it or support it. But we like to share that information with individuals using Ally because it has a lot of really nice features that again make it flexible for your different kinds of students. So one of the things that students can do is to change the color options. It starts out with what they call neutral, which is light background with dark text. You can change it to sepia or sepia, where it kind of gives that yellowish color similar to like a book page. And there's also a night option, so a dark background with lighter text. This can be really nice for students accessing these materials late at night 
or who have screen fatigue, so their eyes are getting tired. And for some individuals, this contrast is just more comfortable or easier to read than others. It's generally, personally, my preferred version of accessing materials. Students can also change the font size within the document and have some options to change the font style. So again, making it really easy for individuals to control what that format looks like to make it most accessible to them. They can change how it's displayed, either paginated, so more again, like a book, or that more traditional one size or one column scrolling. One of the things that I really like about Thorium Reader that not all EPUB reader softwares have is the ability to change the spacing. So this can be really, really nice for students with different types of vision-based disabilities, either a limited range of vision or low vision, and for students with learning disabilities who may have difficulty tracking on a page. So students can increase the margins to make it narrower on the screen. They can, uh, here, let me scroll down to more text so you can see it. They can increase the spacing between words. Oh, it just brought me right back up here, but you can kind of see that. Increase the spacing between individual letters. Increase spacing between paragraphs. And increase spacing between lines. So all of those adjustments can really help with students who have their eyes jump around the page a little bit. So it tends to merge information from different lines. And uh, therefore they can understand a lot more of the reading on their first read through rather than having to read it five or six times to really comprehend what is in that material. The other really nice feature of Thorium Reader is its built-in read out loud or text to speech feature. I'll play that for just a moment. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. I can't hear anything yet, Amy, and you might need to okay. stop sharing and then in Zoom hit the um, share sound option when you're choosing which screen to share. Okay. Could you still see the highlighting though? Um, we only see your Chrome browser. Oh, you're not seeing the Thorium Reader at all? Correct, yeah. Oh, let me switch that over so you could actually see what I've been talking about. All right, so okay. now are you seeing the? That looks good. Yeah, we can see Thorium now. So okay. you might need to quickly repeat yourself, sorry. <laughs> yep, nope, that's all right. We still can't hear it, but we can see the highlighting that's like Okay. So the voice is kind of a computerized voice, but it highlights as it reads, which again really helps with that tracking. So for students who again have difficulty with keeping their eyes on one line of a page or who maybe need a little assistance with focusing, it gives another piece for their brain to focus on which can really help with that comprehension piece. And especially for students with learning disabilities or attention deficit um, disorder, that can be helpful, but also just for students who are tired. <laughs> Their eyes are tired. And so having that additional focus can really help them with the tracking piece. So just a review, now that you can actually see what I was talking about, uh, different, different color themes that students can choose to make it more comfortable for them, different font sizes, 
And again, trying to keep as much of that information on the screen as possible to reduce that side to side scrolling needed. Different font styles. Page layout options. And then the, the piece that uh, I was talking about that I really like. is that spacing piece where students can increase margin size so make it narrower on the screen increase spacing between individual words increase spacing between individual letters between paragraphs so you see how below the butterfly it uh, increases size, but above the butterfly, it does not because that's not two separate paragraphs. But if I instead go to increase line spacing, it will adjust it ever so slightly as well. So these different options really give students with different needs the best comfort and ease of access in uh, getting this information. So that's why we really like this Thorium reader. Um, again, like I said, this is not a Blackboard product. It, it is a free software that students could choose to download to access this information. All right. So I will switch back to sharing my browser. Krista also shared in the chat um that ally has videos on our help site that individuals can use and access all right i'm switching over and i thought i saw something pop up in chat I got uh, it. go ahead okay. and continue so next is an option that I can't demonstrate for you, uh, but this is a very useful file format for students who utilize Braille. It's the electronic Braille format. And this is specially customized for individuals utilizing um, refreshable Braille displays. So these are essentially screenless computers that uh, have little bumps down at the bottom, which raise and lower to create different Braille characters that individuals who read Braille can follow along. And this way, individuals using this device can access different files, they can access websites, pretty much anything you can uh, use a computer with a screen to access, an individual can use a refreshable Brailler to access. They can also type responses in Braille using the large keys at the top. Hitting those in different combinations will create different Braille characters. And then when they share the electronic file outputted by that device, the sighted user sees text. So an automatic conversion happens within it that turns those Braille characters into text. So it is not a file format that will be used as extensively as perhaps an HTML page, but it can be a truly key and crucial option for individuals who use these refreshable Braille displays, because otherwise they often have to rely on hearing in order to access their content. Uh, and that can get exhausting. And um, also, you know, I had a student at one of my previous institutions who read Braille. They were they were blind. They used Braille, and they also had an auditory processing disorder. So it took quite a bit for them to be able to understand information presented verbally. And when they were listening to their materials, they would have to re-listen to it re just repeatedly in order to really comprehend what was being told to them. 
So being able to access things in Braille sped up their comprehension and their ability to complete assignments so, so much. Uh, so there's a there was a question shared in chat regarding the thorium reader or the videos. Uh, so it will be accessible for everyone or only for students. So the student videos that Krista shared a link to on Blackboard's help site are available to everyone. And the thorium reader, the EPUB reader, is available for free to everyone at www dot e b r l a b dot org forward slash software slash thorium t h o r i u m dash reader blackboard ally is available to universities and schools who are part of saudi for other universities though blackboard ally is a licensed product and it will depend if they have acquired Ally or not. And the alternative formats feature is available to students slash learners and teachers slash instructors as long as they have Ally at their school and Ally is turned on in that course. All right, so another file format presented by Ally that can be super duper helpful is the audio format. So I will download that. This one can take a moment depending on the length and complexity of the document. Um, but again, this is a nice flexible feature for students uh, who are commuting. Again, this will allow them to listen in the car or on the bus. Um, and also, you know, if your student wants to go to the gym, they can listen to the reading at the gym. Maybe they have a desk job where they can do some coursework and being able to listen will allow them to continue their learning while they are doing their work. For parents who are up with their baby at 3 a.m., uh, being able to listen to the reading while they get their child back to sleep could really help them utilize that time. All right, so I am going to stop sharing and see if I can share the uh, audio reader. And a thank you, thank you for sharing such helpful videos and a great tool. Absolutely, we're happy to do so. I think I need to first open the downloaded file and then it will allow me to share that. Okay. So now I will switch over. To that and Let's see if this works. All right, so were you able to hear that at all? Um, sorry, Amy, we were not. Yeah, when you're in okay. the screen view in Zoom, there's a little box at the very bottom left side of the screen that says share audio or share sound. So that has to be clicked when you do the screen sharing, otherwise we won't hear it. Well, I had clicked on it prior. Hmm. It could also be because you're wearing a headset that there just might that be, could be. That's yeah. probably what's going on. Yeah. Okay. So uh I will tell you instead what it does. It reads out the uh, format of the file as well as the text. So when it is reading, it will tell individuals that this top part is a title or a heading one. 
it will say image without alternative text because in the original document this picture of a butterfly does not have any alternative text informing the reader that that's what they're seeing general information um, and it will tell you if it's a link and if there's a list of items it will read out that it's a list so it makes that formatting auditory to the individual to help create an image of what that file looks like or what that document looks like um, to really help them get a similar experience to an individual site or an individual accessing that file format in a visual manner. There was also a question, uh, does it require internet? The initial download of any of the alternative formats does require internet access. But after you have downloaded a file like the audio version or HTML, it is stored on your device and you do not need internet connection to use it. So that's another way that Ally can be very useful to individuals who may not always have connection to an internet available. Maybe they need to go to a public place to use internet there. Maybe the internet at their home is unreliable. So being able to download it in another format and store it on their device means they can continue working on their materials even if the internet goes out. All right. So just a couple more file formats that I will be going over. The next one is a one that you may not be familiar with. It is called Beeline Reader, and it is an HTML file that has some additional color overlays added to the text. So it adds, as the default, a black to blue to black to red flow to the text color. And the intent of this is to assist with the eyes moving across the screen. It was originally made with speed readers in mind, individuals who could read very quickly with, while still being able to comprehend the material. It can be useful to individuals with disabilities by again, allowing another way for eyes to track across the screen. So that change of color gives another cue to the brain, may help with staying on the line they're supposed to stay on, um, gives another thing for the brain to pay attention to. And for others, uh, just again, be able to perhaps help them read their material a little faster. And there are some different color options. There's a dark mode, can change it to just be shades of blue, shades of gray, and again, that night mode, if the student prefers the dark background with the lighter text. All right. And then the last version that we will go over is one that is not always used at institutions that have Ally. As of right now, the translated version of file formats is an all or nothing option. This means that an institution can decide to turn it on for all of the classes at their institution or turn it off for all of the classes at their institution. Ally is actively working toward making this available on a course by course basis, but for now, it is all or nothing. Um, so if an institution wants to turn it on, we do recommend talking with instructors who teach other languages because a student may be able to use the wide variety of languages offered to change it into um, their own native language and that may interfere with the learning process a little bit. But it can be super duper useful for your students who are learning in their non-native language. 
So it uses automatic translation software. We use the Amazon uh, automatic translation software to create a translated version. So it's not as good as having a human translate, but it can still be really useful for a student who, you know, just needs a couple of those terms in their native language to really understand what you're trying to teach. So dozens of languages offered. So it can be really helpful um, for your students. All right. So a question, what is that tool again that changes the colors of the text of the content of the course web page? That is Beeline Reader. So I'll bring up the alternative format box. The Beeline Reader is the one that adds that uh, red to blue gradient to the text. Okay. And Krista sharing in the chat, Beeline Reader option in Allies Alternative Formats. Learn more about Beeline Reader at www.beelineader.com. All right, I'm going to switch back to the presentation to for just a moment. So as I said before, we also have in the presentation itself different slides on the file formats offered and different groups of students that these file formats may help. So everything that I said verbally is pretty much presented in these these slides a note about the electronic braille for those familiar with braille uh, it does translate it into grade two unified english braille for english documents all right so uh we don't have the poll feature available, so both of these responses can be shared in the chat instead. Uh, but for our audience, which alternative format got you most excited or were you most interested in? And were there any that you wish you had access to during your education? Were there any that you saw that you were like, oh, I wish I had had that, you know, when I was in school? Um, so I'll give a moment for people to share that within the chat. Hi, Amy, this is Krista. While people are sharing their responses in the chat, I wanted to answer that question for myself. Um, I think I would want access to all of them, <laughs> um, with the exception of Braille, because I don't read Braille, unfortunately. Um, but I can think that there were different situations in my education where I would have really preferred an audio version, because I was driving or um, my eyes were tired. Um, or there would be times where I wanted to have a version I could use on my on my smartphone, which is, you know, very small screen. So I would have preferred the HTML version. And then I, I'm curious to, I, I'm, I wonder how the Beeline Reader option would have helped me with maybe some of the comprehension. So I know that's not a specific answer, but I kind of would want access to pretty much all of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I feel similarly that there are a couple, especially the HTML and um, the the EPUB. If if I had also known about Thorium Reader, because there were quite a few times where B 
being able to change that color contrast and having an auditory would have really helped with some of those, you know, graduate school readings <laughs> going through, <laughs> keeping my focus on the drier material. And so we have someone sharing in chat that Beeline Reader, they feel would have, uh, are they're either the one they're most excited about or that they wish they had had, or maybe both. Um, do you have, did you see any others come through chat so far, Krista? Nope, I think that's it at this point. Okay. All right. So if anybody else is still typing, please feel free to continue doing so. But I believe if there are no other questions on the alternative formats, then if I'm not mistaken, Krista, it's your turn. It is. Yes. Thanks so much, Amy. So thank you to all of our attendees who have um, been with us so far. Um, for the last 40 or so minutes of our workshop, I'll be um, leading the, the presentation and such. So I am going to change my view so I have control of the screen. Um, so thanks for your patience with me. Okay, almost there and share go back a couple of slides here there we go so where i wanted to um, also pick up where amy left off is everything we've showed you so far is talking about the um, features that are designed for students and are predominantly used by students but we also have some features explicitly designed for teachers, instructors, and professors. Um, this feature is called the instructor feedback. And this is a mechanism in Ally that is going to provide um, feedback about the accessibility of content that exists in your learning management um, system or in your online course. This is providing awareness. It's providing guidance. Um, giving step-by-step -step instructions about how to make content more usable. And there's three main components. There's a score um, and an indicator. There's the feedback mechanism. And we have a report that lets you get the big picture of what's happening in your course. Um, so if I may, the icons on the screen look like gas gauges or like speedometers in a vehicle. And these are trying to give you some immediate awareness about how accessible and how usable your content is. So the red icon means that it's a very low accessibility score and it has the range between zero and 33%. The orange icon is a medium score, meaning that Ally has given the content somewhere between 34 and 66%. And then a green icon is 67% or higher. Um, these icons will show up next to content items that are in a course. So if I may show you a, an example, um, here is my learn course with ultra navigation um, and you can see next to my syllabus I have a red icon next to another example we have a green icon and then a third file has an orange kind of a yellow orange icon um, so this is providing that immediate guidance of this is a file that needs more attention um, than others, or this document is actually pretty good. Um, I'll show you the, the full mechanism in a moment, if I may go back one more screen. Um, the feedback mechanism is going to look like this. When you click on the icon, it will pull up this screen where you can see the original document on one side. And on the other side, we have information such as the title, the score, one of the accessibility issues, and then a button that says what this means, as well as a button that says how to add descriptions. Um, so let's actually explore this together in my demo environment. So I'm going to use 
my syllabus as my example. So I'm going to click on the icon and this is launching the feedback mechanism. So this is what my original document looks like. It's a syllabus, it's five pages long. It has some text, it has some bullets, there's an image. On the right hand side, um, it's biology syllabus is the name at the top. And then we have the score, which is 31%. We have one of the um, issues identified below, such as a um, document has images that are missing a description. For those that are brand new and have no idea what that means, we can select this button, which will provide very short explanation as to what an image description is. In this case, an image description is a text description of what the image is. For those of us that have sight, we get a lot of information through our eyes. If you don't have sight though, you're going to rely on an audio um, description or using technology to explain what that image is. And that can only happen if there's um, a textual explanation of that image. There's two buttons at the bottom on the right and left where you can get more information, such as why is this important? What is the impact to my learners? So that's all contained in the first button of what this means. The second button is how to add description step by step. So I'm going to select that button next. To be very clear, Ally is not changing your original content. If you want your score to become higher, somebody will need to make the improvements themselves. So a human will need to make the changes. Ally is not going to change the original content for you to get you a higher score. So Ally is going to say step one is to find the original document and download it. And I've already downloaded to my computer. The next step is to choose what authoring software you, you use. Um, I have Office 365 on my computer, so that's what I'll select. And now it's saying step one, open the original document. Step two, there's one image missing a description. Step three is to right click the image and select edit alt text and then the alt text panel opens. So it's telling me what buttons to press in Microsoft Word in order to make this accessibility improvement. Step four is where I would enter a description. And then step five is to repeat for all images in the document. So let's pause there. I'm going to actually do these steps so you can see um, what this would look like in real life. One important note before I forget, I'm showing um, Ally in English it is also available in Arabic. So if you would prefer to have these instructions available in Arabic, it is available to you. Um, it would just be part of your course settings. So if you log into Blackboard and your course settings is Arabic, then Ally um, should show in Arabic. If you have it set in English, then it should show in English. And we have some other languages available as well. Okay, so let's go to my original document which is right, it's opening up on my screen. Okay, so here's my original document. And then image that has the missing alternative text, which is this image on the first page. I then select it, right click, choose edit alt text, and now within Microsoft, I have a couple of options. Option one is I need to look at the image and decide how I would describe it. So our teachers, our instructors are the subject matter experts. So they understand and know what is the important information contained in an image. Some images have a lot of really important information other images are not that important. They're really there to make something look prettier. 
So as the expert, you need to decide what is the important information in this image. Um, so in this case, I am not a biology expert. I'm not a chemistry expert. So molecule is as far as I can go with describing this image um, for this example. So that could be sufficient. Um, there might need to be more information. Um, there might not. It just really depends upon what is the value of that image. So um, I'll go ahead and leave it. Well, let me show you two other options I have as well. Another option in Microsoft is you can use Microsoft's artificial intelligence to make the image description for you. So if you check the box, select the box of generate a description for me, Microsoft is looking at the image and using technology to type out what it thinks the image contains. In this case, Microsoft said water droplets on surface, on a surface, and then the description was automatically generated with medium confidence. So there's a little blurb in there saying, hey, this was created using um, automated technology. So you could, if that's a appropriate description based upon the course, based upon your expertise, based upon the image, then you could leave that as it is, water droplets on a surface. Um, the last option you have is to mark an image as decorative. So remember I said that sighted people have a lot of information that comes through their eyes, um, but some images don't have valuable information. They're really there to make something look prettier or look better or look interesting. If that's the case where you have an image that is not offering valuable info, you can mark it as decorative. What that will do is communicate to your um, blind students that use technology. It will communicate, there is an image here, but there's no valuable information in this image. So that way the person who is blind understands um, what's happening. So in this case, I will leave this marked as decorative. Um, I will go ahead and resave this with a, a different name. And then let's go back to Ally to see what the next instructions are. So let me go back to my uh, Chrome browser. All right, pardon me one second. I need to close out of my PowerPoint. There we go. Here we go. So I just did steps one, two, three, four, and five in Ally. So I looked at the image. I right clicked. I opened the alt text panel. I entered a description. Well, actually, I marked it as decorative, which is an option. And then there was only one image, so no other work is needed. And then my very last step is to take that improved file and re-upload it into Ally. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. I have multiple monitors, so I'm moving my my head based upon what monitor I'm looking at. So I have my file. I'm going to drag and drop. This is going to upload my improved new file and it will replace the original file. My original score was 31%. I am now at 51%. So with that one fix, I increased my score by 20 percentage points. So that's a, that's a good use of my time. There are still some other issues with this document, such as the document does not have headings um, or the document has text with poor color contrast. If you focus on either of those issues, Ally will tell you what your score will increase to if you fix that one issue. So if I fix the text with poor contrast, my score will go up two percentage points. If I fix the headings issue, my score will increase to almost 100. And again, Ally is going to show you where those issues live um, with regards to the color contrast.
so you will know exactly where there are issues. Um, a lot of colors that are up against a white background that are brighter colors are not going to be accessible. So if you take one thing away, <laughs> the one thing is, is to not use the color red um, in your course as far as communicating out important information because some people do not see the color red so they will not understand what you're trying to say if you use red font up against a white background. All right, so let me pause for a moment. Um, I would love to give attendees a chance to ask questions. Um, and Amy did share some information in the Zoom chat about the um, help link for image descriptions. Um, it's going to be available on our help site. So let me show you where that is for our live streamers. It's going to be at help.blackboard.com and ally and then ally for LMS. And then under ally for LMS, there's an instructor option. And then under instructor, there's a section called improve content accessibility it's available on the left hand side, as well as a box on the home page. You can select that option and then specifically what we've been talking about is add image descriptions. So a lot of fantastic information is available at help.blackboard.com and then choose ally from the left hand navigation and then ally for LMS. So thanks, Amy. I'm not sure if I see any questions, so I will carry on so we can get to some data. Um, last thing I want to share in my demo is the course accessibility report. So this is the report designed for instructors to get a sense of how their course is doing overall with regards to accessibility. So under your course tools option in Blackboard, there is an accessibility report if your school has Ally and if Ally is turned on in your course. Selecting accessibility report is going to open this uh, information where we can see the name of the course at the top. We can see the score. In this case, it's 61%. We see a colorful pie chart and table telling us the amount of content that exists in the course. So there's 26 images, 22 PDFs, 21 Word documents, 16 items, and so on. There's two pathways for getting started, if you select content with the easiest issues to fix, pressing the start option is going to pull up a list of the content items or a list of files with easier accessibility issues to improve. We can see a list of all of the files and selecting the icon is going to launch that feedback mechanism. So in this case, this is a screenshot and the image is missing a description. Again, we can get information about what this means and then how to write a good description. And for this um, example, I can actually type in a, a description right here and add it to the file um, and then my score would increase. Um, we also have a similar pathway focusing on the lowest scores. And as we scroll down, we can see the list of specific accessibility issues. So for example, there are 24 documents that have color contrast issues. Selecting that row will pull up a list of the files with that specific accessibility barrier. So if you feel overwhelmed, it's understandable because most teachers or instructors have not had any accessibility 
professional development before. So it might feel very overwhelming for this, this new world of accessibility. If you focus on just learning one thing, you can apply that knowledge to all of the documents that have that one issue. And you can focus on that one issue for four months and then the next four months you can focus on a different issue. So we're not trying to say fix everything at once. We're trying to give you tools so you can make small changes over time. The idea is let's make progress versus trying to reach perfection. I'm going to say that again because it's really important. Don't try to fix everything at once. Just make small fixes over time. Focus on making progress versus reaching perfection versus, you know, getting 100%. If you go from 61 to 65%, that is awesome. It is a beautiful win and that's very realistic. Going from 60% to 100% is not the most realistic because all of our, our teachers and instructors are very busy. And Amy is putting in the Zoom chat, focus on progress, not perfection. All right. So we've concluded the full demo of Ally, the student-facing features and the instructor-facing features. We do want to share some data about the state of accessibility in Saudi Arabia. Um, for our last 15 minutes. So I will go back to my PowerPoint and pick up where I left off. Uh, yep, let's start here. So the instructor feedback does not change anything you're doing. It provides you information about your own content. It's an easy way to raise awareness and an easy way to start learning something to make small changes. The course report allows you to get information about your entire class um, and to get good data about where you might want to start. And it's really easy um, for professional development to just pick one thing, focus on it, and then focus on something else in the next several months. For those of you that would um, like a longer or more in-depth demo about Ally, these are the individuals who can help us um, with setting that up. So we have Ahmad and we have Basil and we have Samir. Um, and we'll make sure that their emails are distributed, perhaps as part of the recording or after um, materials. But for our conference organizers, for any attendee who's interested in learning more, these are the individuals who can help um, facilitate that. All right, so data. Um, when we saw those alternative format options, the audio, the beeline reader, the language translation, the braille option, some of you might be thinking, well, what's the most popular download? So let's answer these two questions of what are students downloading and then how does Saudi compare to other regions? So um, we're going to skip this part due to time. Um, the answer is, in Saudi Arabia from August 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, there have been 1.1 million alternative format downloads. So in, in Saudi <laughs> at schools, um, uh, most of the schools in Saudi have Ally and are using it um, for the that time period of, let me go back, August 1st, 2020 to um, the 30th of June, 2021, there were 1.1 million alternative format downloads. The majority of those downloads were PDFs, and there was approximately 635 thousand PDFs downloaded by students. It was easily the most popular format. HTML was the next most popular alternative format downloaded at 237,000 downloads. So a lot of students um, wanted more content to be flexible on mobile devices. 
So they've turned it into a web page or HTML version. And then EPUB was the next most downloaded alternative format at 154,000. Um, and then the others had less somewhere, they had somewhere between 20,000 and 40,000 downloads. Um, but wait, there's more. So when are the alternative formats being downloaded? Ally can also tell us when students are downloading those alternative formats. This is a line graph showing the peaks of the highest usage and the valleys of the lowest usage. So the two peaks for schools in um, Saudi, for students and learners in Saudi, there was a peak around um, the first part of December of 2020. And then there was another peak around early April 2021. Now, this um, is pretty typical. Um, we know that students are downloading the alternative formats the most at the beginning of a course um, or perhaps around assessment or examination weeks. When um, so around January 1st, there's a very low usage. It's a very big drop. Um, holidays, students are not downloading alternative formats over holidays or over school breaks. Um, that's not surprising, right? <laughs> um, so what is the original file type? So there's been 1.1 million alternative format downloads. 48% of those downloads, the original file was a PowerPoint presentation. About 26% of the time, those downloads came from the original PDF. So um, a lot of students are turning PowerPoints and PDFs into other file types. It's very interesting. And then there's a small um, section, about 12%, where people are turning Word documents into different file formats. And then the last um, chunk is if you were starting with original or native Blackboard content, turning that content into something else. So for whatever reason, when you give students a PowerPoint presentation, it's pretty likely that they're turning that into a different file format um, using Ally. We suspect it could be due to file sizes. PowerPoints tend to be very large and thus they are hard to move from device to device. Um, let's look at some comparisons. So what I have here is um, looking at Word documents versus PDFs versus PowerPoints. So if you give students a Word document, most of the time they're going to turn that Word document into a PDF. And I know this because PDF has the highest number in that blue column on the far left. So if you give students a Word document, they're more likely to turn it into a PDF. If you start with a PDF though, students are most likely to turn it into HTML. So there's been 209,000 instances where students went from a PDF into a web page or HTML version of the content. Now, if you give students a PowerPoint, most of the time they're turning that into a PDF. So it's very interesting. If there's not one file format that is the best, because the needs are different. Every file type has its own strength. And that's the beauty of Ally is students have the option to choose which file format will work best for them in their particular situation. All right, I have a couple more slides of data. So if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed with numbers, hang in there just for a couple more minutes. Um, we do want to point out that instructors and teachers can download the alternative formats as well. So some people wonder, well, how many of these downloads are from teachers versus students? And we can tell you with confidence that 98%
of the alternative formats in Saudi occurred from students. And this number in the middle, where it says 176,000 users, that is referring to 176,000 unique learners in Saudi who have downloaded at least one alternative format. I'll say that again. There have been 176,000 unique learners in Saudi who have downloaded at least one alternative format. That number alone speaks to the need for flexible content. Um, something else we can look at is the average number of downloads per student. So if we're working with about 1.1 million um, downloads divided by the number of unique students, that gives us on average that each student is downloading Allies Alternative Format about six and a half times for that time period of um, August 1 to September, um, uh, excuse me, to June 30th. Now, you might be curious, okay, how does Saudi compare to other regions? So there's three columns on this table. Each column is representing a different region. So Saudi is that first column. The next column is trying to capture um, the geographical area between Europe and Middle East and Africa. And then we have the global option on the very far right. So there have been 1.1 million downloads in Saudi. There have been 6.8 million downloads um, in universities in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And there have been 25 million downloads across the entire globe for the same time period of um, August 1st to um, June 30th. What's interesting is the most popular alternative formats is the same for each of these regions. Um, so PDF is the most popular download um, across all of the regions. And then next, HTML is the most popular, second most popular alternative format across all regions. And then EPUB is in third place. I do want to point out that translation is more used in Saudi than in other regions. So if we look at the percentage, um, about three and a half percent of your 1.1 million downloads are from the translated are, are the translated option. If we look at the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region, um, only, less than one percent of all downloads are the translated option. And then if we look globally, that number decrease or the percentage decreases where about half of a percent of all downloads globally are the translated option. So I love the comments earlier talking about students that speak different languages. Um, that is very much reflected in the data for the ally usage that we see on the screen. All right, we're almost um, to the end. So I do want to leave you with some ideas as far as next steps. So what can we do? Well, it depends upon what role you have. So if you are a policymaker, it is important to ensure that digital accessibility is included in laws, policies, procedures, mandates, statutes, um, initiatives. Um, so ensuring that digital accessibility is part of our online learning experience is really important. Using built-in accessibility checkers in like Microsoft or Adobe um, can help you identify issues before you share out documents. Um, if I may demonstrate um, really quickly, let me pull up that syllabus document. If you're in Microsoft Word, you have a built-in accessibility checker in the latest versions of Word. If you're under the review tab, there's your check document for spelling and such, but there's also a button called check accessibility. Selecting that button will pull up um, issues 
that Microsoft has detected. So it's very similar to Ally, but you don't need to have an Ally in order to use Microsoft's built-in checker. So just pressing the check accessibility button is really important for anyone who creates Word documents. Um, and then also for policymakers, identifying a person whose job it is to make sure that things are accessible. That is a, a very important expectation um, or initiative to implement. Um, what about educators? Um, I assume most of our attendees are educators. So if you are um, especially part of the of, of, of the schools in Saudi, um, be sure to use Ally and the instructor feedback and the course accessibility report. If you're not in Saudi but are interested in Ally, um, talk to your online learning department, your distance education department, your um, learning management system administrator and ask them about Ally because you might have it you might have it available at your institution, but it may not be turned on in your course. Um, learn how it, digital accessibility supports all types of learners and provide multiple ways for students to achieve the same learning objectives. This is where we can talk about universal design for learning, which will be a, a completely separate um, workshop, maybe in this next, um, next year's conference. If you are a student or learner, we encourage you to use Ally's alternative formats. Um, you're also welcome to ask educators about what they're doing to support digital accessibility. And it's really important for students and learners to share with their instructors and teachers what works for them. So if the instructor is already doing something that's really helpful for you, tell them so they know that they're having a positive impact. If you are an administrator or a, a leader or a dean or a chair or a vice president or a provost or a president um, or like a chancellor at a, a school, then set the expectation that any content that is created or shared or purchased or borrowed, that it needs to be accessible, right? This is a multiple year journey that we should start now. Use built-in accessibility checkers in your documents, and then also um, consider identifying a person responsible for accessibility in each unit of the school. So if you have a, a biology unit and a math unit and a, um, a history unit, have a point person in each of those departments or units who is going to help instructors with making content accessible. And then lastly, if you don't fit in any of those other job titles, um, we encourage you to still learn about universal design for learning, especially as it applies to content. Talking to people who have disabilities or special needs about common barriers in their educational experience is really insightful. Um, I've worked with a, a student who is blind who wanted to learn to read Thai. So we ended up making Thai Braille so that blind student could learn to read using Braille in the Thai language. And then lastly, just use the built-in accessibility checkers that are available to you for free. So with that, I have taken up all of our time. If you have follow-up questions, um, you're welcome to send that to the conference uh, leaders and then they can forward that to Amy and myself. We wanted to say thank you so much for your um, participation in the Zoom chat as well as for our live streamers. Um, and with that, we wish you the best of evenings or afternoons or morning, depending upon where you're from. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you being here.
All right, is there anything else that you need from Amy or I before we leave this Zoom room? Okay, I think we'll hop off since we don't see or hear anything in the in the chat or on audio. So um, again, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks for the opportunity and let us know if there's any follow up questions that we can help answer. Thank you all. Have a great evening and a great tomorrow. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye.